Arrivals. The train now standing at platform 5 will be the 1025 to Exeter St. David's, calling at Reading, Pusey, Westbury and Taunton. Excuse me. Mr. Ward? Yes? I'm Charles Archer from Continental Computers. How do you do? How do you do? Thank you for coming to meet us. Not at all. Did you have a good trip? Yes, thank you. Oh, I'd like you to meet Philip Mason. He's our sales manager. How do you do? The train now standing at platform three is the 1020 intercity service to Bristol. Sarah! Hi. Hi. I haven't seen you for ages. How's things? All right. And you? Fine. How's work? Okay. Do you fancy a coffee? Oh, yes, I'd love one. The train now arriving at platform two is the 912 from Oxford. Hello, Dorothy. Hello, Margaret. How are you? Very well, thanks. And you? Oh, I'm fine. How's the family? Well, they're all fine. My car's just outside the station. Shall I take one of your bags? Oh, yes. Thank you. The next train leaving from Platform 9 will be the 1025 intercity service to Plymouth and Penzance. The train will be divided at Plymouth. Passengers for stations to Penzance should take the front six carriages. Good morning. Good morning. Single to Exeter, please. £14.70, please. There you are. Thank you. Um, what time's the next train? 10.25. Thank you. The train now arriving at platform 12 is the 7.10 from Swansea. Trains from Swansea are running approximately 15 minutes late due to maintenance work between Swansea and Cardiff. Hello there. I beg your pardon? Hello. How are you getting on? Fine, thank you. Sorry, do I know you? Yes, it's me, Nick Fowler. Sorry, I don't think I know you. Aren't you Harry Shiner? Uh, no, I'm afraid not. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I thought you were someone else. Is everything ready? This Is Your Life is one of the most popular programs on British and American television. Every week a famous person is invited to a television studio without knowing that he or she will be the subject of the program. The compare meets the person outside the studio and says, This Is Your Life. The person then meets friends and relatives from his or her past and present. Studio 4 is where the program is recorded. The program begins at 8 o'clock. It's 6.45 now, and the director is checking the preparations with his new production assistant. The subject of tonight's show will be an actor, Jason Douglas. The compare, as usual, will be Terry Donovan. Let's just check the arrangements. We're bringing Jason Douglas here in a studio car. He thinks he's coming to a discussion program. The driver has been told to arrive at exactly 7.55. Now the program begins at 8 o'clock. At that time, Jason will be walking to the studio. Terry Donovan will start his introduction at 8.01, and Jason will arrive at 8.02. Terry will meet him at the studio entrance. Camera 4 will be there. Then he'll take him to that seat. It'll be on camera 3. Jason will be sitting there during the whole program. For most of the show, Terry will be standing in the middle, and he'll be on camera 2. The guests will come through that door, talk to Terry and Jason, and then sit over there. Now, is that all clear? Yes, there's just one thing. Well, what is it? Who's going to look after the guests during the show? Pauline is. And where will they be waiting during the show? In room 401, as usual. Pauline will be waiting with them, and she'll be watching the show on the monitor. She'll tell them two minutes before they enter. I think that's everything. This is your life.
Good evening and welcome to This Is Your Life. This is Terry Donovan speaking. We're waiting for the subject of tonight's program. He's one of the world's leading actors, and he thinks he's coming here to take part in a discussion program. I can hear him now. Yes, here he is. Jason Douglas, This Is Your Life. Oh, no. I don't believe it. Not me. Yes, you. Now, come over here and sit down. Jason, you were born at number 28 Balaclava Street in East Ham, London, on July the 2nd, 1947. You were one of six children, and your father was a taxi driver. Of course, your name was then Graham Smith. Now, do you know this voice? I remember Jason when he was two. He used to scream and shout all day. Susan! Yes, all the way from Sydney, Australia. She flew here specially for this program. It's your sister, Susan Fraser. Susan! <laughs> Why didn't you tell me? Oh, <laughs> this is wonderful. Yes, you haven't seen each other for 13 years. Take a seat next to him, Susan. You started school at the age of five in 1952, and in 1958, you moved to Lane End Secondary School. Do you remember this voice? Smith, stop looking out of the window. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> it's Mr. Hooper! Your English teacher, Mr. Stanley Hooper. It was Jason a good student, Mr. Hooper. Hey. No, he was the worst in the class. But he was a brilliant actor, even in those days. He could imitate all the teachers. Thank you, Mr. Hooper. You can speak to Jason later. Well, you went to the London School of Drama in 1966 and left in 1969. In 1973, you went to Hollywood. Do you know this voice? Hi, Jason. Can you ride a horse yet? Maria! Maria Montrose, who's come from Hollywood to be with you tonight. Hello, Jason. Oh, it's great to be here. Hello, Terry. Jason and I were in a movie together in 1974. Jason had to learn to ride a horse. Well, Jason doesn't like horses very much. Like them? I'm terrified of them. <laughs> anyway, he practiced for two weeks. Then he went to the director, it was Charles Orson, and said, What do you want me to do? Charles said, I want you to fall off the horse. Jason was furious. He said, what? Fall off? I've been practicing for two weeks. I could fall off the first day without any practice. The Monte Carlo Rally. The Monte Carlo Rally, which started in 1911, is Europe's most famous motoring event. Competitors leave from several points around Europe and follow routes of approximately equal length to a rallying point, which will be Geneva this year. They then follow a single route to the finish. The rally consists of five daily stages, beginning on Sunday morning, and each competitor will have driven about 3,000 kilometres by Thursday night. It is not a race. The winner is decided on a point system. Drivers have to maintain an average speed between control points, and there are also special tests of driving skill in different conditions on the way. This is Radio Wessex on 203 metres medium wave. It's 9 o'clock on Monday the 25th of January, and this is Barry King reporting from Dover. The British competitors in the Monte Carlo Rally have just arrived here at the end of the second stage in this year's competition. Russell Cook, who's driving a Sunbeam Lotus, is leading. The triumph, driven by Tony Bond, who won last year's rally, crashed in Yorkshire this morning. Tony was unhurt, but will be unable to continue. Seven other cars have withdrawn due to bad weather conditions. Tonight, the cars which left from Glasgow on Sunday morning will be crossing the English Channel. Out of work. In Britain, a lot of people are out of work. Tracy Chapman is 18, and she left school a year ago. She lives in the northeast, an area of high youth unemployment. She hasn't been able to find a job yet. My dad just doesn't understand. He started working in a steel mill when he was 15. Things are different now. But he thinks I should start bringing home some money. Oh, I get my unemployment benefit, but that isn't much and I'm fed up with queuing for it every Thursday. I hate having to ask my mum and dad for money. Oh, my mum gives me a couple of pounds for tights now and then. But she can't stand seeing me at home all day. I've almost given up looking for a job. I buy the local paper every day, but I'm really tired of looking through the situation's vacant column. There are 50 applicants for every job. I was interested in being a dentist receptionist because I like meeting people. 
But now I take any job at all. People ask me why I don't move to London, but I don't want to leave my family and friends. Anyway, I'm scared of living on my own in a big city. George Morley is 54. Until last year, he was a production manager in the textile industry. He had worked for the same company since he left school. He had a good job, a four-bedroomed house and a company car. When his company had to close because of economic difficulties, he became redundant. It's funny, really. I don't feel old, but it isn't easy to start looking for a job at my age. I've had so many refusals. Now I'm frightened of applying for a job. All the interviewers are 20 years younger than me. You see, I'm interested in learning a new skill, but nobody wants to train me. I can see their point of view. I'll have to retire in 10 years. It's just... Well, I'm tired of sitting around the house. I've worked hard for nearly 40 years, and now I'm terrified of having nothing to do. When I was still with Lancastrian Textiles, I was bored with doing the same thing day after day, but now I'd really enjoy doing a job again. Any job, really. It's not the money. I got good redundancy pay, and the house is paid for, and I've given up smoking. No, it's not just money. I just need to feel, well, useful. That's all. Battle of Trafalgar Street. <laughs> This is Pennine Radio News. Alan Nelson reporting from Trafalgar Street. Mr Hardy, the Tadworth Housing Officer, has agreed to speak to us. Now, Mr Hardy, has the situation changed since last night? No, it hasn't. Mrs Hamilton is still there and she's still refusing to talk to us. Well, what are you going to do? It's a very difficult situation. We'd like her to come out peacefully. The police don't intend to prosecute her, but she's a very stubborn lady. Stubborn? Yes, well, it is her home. I agree, and it's been her home for a long time, I know. But nobody else refused to move. You see, a lot of people in this area are living in substandard accommodation. And we are going to build over 300 flats on this site. Families are expecting to move into them next year. It's all being delayed because of one person. But Mrs Hamilton was born in that house. Of course, of course. But we have promised to give her a modern flat immediately. A very nice flat, which is ideal for an elderly person living alone. So, what happens next? I don't know. I really don't. But we can't wait forever. The police will have to do something soon. It, it won't be easy. She's got two very big dogs, and they don't like strangers. We have also managed to arrange an interview with Mrs. Hamilton. She has decided to speak to us, but she has demanded to see me alone. Mrs. Hamilton! Who are you? I'm Alan Nelson, Pennine Radio News. Well, don't come any closer or I'll let the dogs out. Down, Caesar. Sit, boy. I'm sure our listeners would like to hear your side of the story. There's not much to say. I'm not moving. I was born here. I had my children here, and I intend to die here. But the council really need to have this land, and they have arranged to provide a new flat for you. Oh, yes, I know. But I can't take my dogs with me, and I need to have company. My dogs are all I've got. Down, boy! How long can you stay here? Oh, I've got plenty of food. The council have threatened to cut off the water and electricity, but I'll be all right. Well, thank you, Mrs. Hamilton, and good luck. And you can tell the council from me... I want another house where I can keep me dogs, not a little flat in a bloody high-rise block. Marriage Guidance Council Malcolm and Barbara Harris have been married for nearly 15 years. They've got two children, Gary, aged 13, and Andrea, who's 11. During the last couple of years, Malcolm and Barbara haven't been very happy. They argue all the time. Barbara's sister advised them to go to the Marriage Guidance Council. There is one in most British towns. It's an organisation which allows people to talk with a third person about their problems. 
This is their third visit, and Mrs. Murray, the counsellor, always sees them. Ah, come in, Barbara. Take a seat. Is your husband here? Yes, he's waiting outside. He didn't want to come here this week, but, well, I persuaded him to come. I see. How have things been? Oh, much the same. We still seem to have rows all the time. What do you quarrel about? What don't we quarrel about, you mean? Oh, everything. You see, he's so inconsiderate. Go on. Well, I'll give you an example. You know, when the children started school, I wanted to go back to work again, too. So I got a job. Well, anyway, by the time I've collected Gary and Andrea from school, I only get home about half an hour before Malcolm. Yes. Well, when he gets home, he expects me to run around and get his tea. He never does anything in the house. Mm. And last Friday, he invited three of his friends to come round for a drink. He didn't tell me to expect them, and I'd had a long and difficult day. I don't think that's right, do you? Barbara, I'm not here to pass judgment. I'm here to listen. Sorry. And he's so untidy. He's worse than the kids. I always have to remind him to pick up his clothes. He just throws them on the floor. After all, I'm not his servant. I've got my own career. Actually, I think that's part of the trouble. You see, I earn as much money as he does. Malcolm, I'm so glad you could come. Hello, Mrs. Murray. Well, I'll be honest, Barbara had to force me to come, really. Does it embarrass you to talk about your problems? Yes, it does. But I suppose we need to talk to somebody. Barbara feels that you... Well, you resent her job. I don't know. I would prefer her to stay at home, but she's very well qualified, and I encourage her to go back to work. Now the kids are at school, she needs an interest, and I suppose we need the money. How do you share the housework? I try to help. I always help her to wash up, and I help Gary and Angie to do their homework while she does the dinner. But she doesn't think that's enough. What do you think? I'm not here to give an opinion, Malcolm. I think we're both too tired, that's all. In the evenings, we're both too tired to talk. And Barbara, she never allows me to suggest anything about the house or about the kids. We always have the same arguments. She's got her own opinions and that's it. Last night we had another row. She's forbidden the kids to ride their bikes to school. Why? She thinks they're too young to ride in the traffic, but I think they should. She always complains about collecting them from school. But you can't wrap children in cotton wool, can you? A funny thing happened to me. A funny thing happened to me last Friday. I'd gone to London to do some shopping. I wanted to get some Christmas presents, and I needed to find some books for my course at college. You see, I'm a student. I caught an early train to London, so by early afternoon I'd bought everything that I wanted. Anyway, I'm not very fond of London, all the noise and traffic, and I'd made some arrangements for that evening. So I took a taxi to Waterloo Station. I can't really afford taxis, but I wanted to get the 3.30 train. Unfortunately, the taxi got stuck in a traffic jam, and by the time I got to Waterloo, the train had just gone. I had to wait an hour for the next one. I bought an evening newspaper, the Standard, and wandered over to the station buffet. At that time of day, it's nearly empty, so I bought a coffee and a packet of biscuits, chocolate biscuits. I'm very fond of chocolate biscuits. There were plenty of empty tables, and I found one near the window. I sat down and began doing the crossword. I always enjoy doing crossword puzzles. After a couple of minutes, a man sat down opposite me. There was nothing special about him, except that he was very tall. In fact, he looked like a typical city businessman. You know, dark suit and briefcase. I didn't say anything, and I carried on with my crossword. Suddenly... He reached across the table, opened my packet of biscuits, took one, dipped it into his coffee, and popped it into his mouth. I couldn't believe my eyes. I was too shocked to say anything. Anyway, I didn't want to make a fuss, so I decided to ignore it. I always avoid trouble if I can. I just took a biscuit myself and went back to my crossword. When the man took a second biscuit, I didn't look up and I didn't make a sound. I pretended to be very interested in the puzzle. After a couple of minutes, I casually put out my hand, took the last biscuit and glanced at the man. He was staring at me furiously. I nervously put the biscuit in my mouth and decided to leave. 
I was ready to get up and go when the man suddenly pushed back his chair, stood up and hurried out of the buffet. I felt very relieved and decided to wait two or three minutes before going myself. I finished my coffee, folded my newspaper and stood up. And there, on the table where my newspaper had been, was my packet of biscuits. Polite Requests Max Millwall used to be a popular comedian on British radio. He's nearly 70 now, but he still performs in clubs in the Midlands and north of England. He's on stage now at the All Star Variety Club in Wigan. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and others. It's nice to be back in Wigan again. Well, I have to say that. I say it every night. I said it last night. The only trouble was that I was in Birmingham. I thought the audience looked confused. Actually, I remember Wigan very well indeed. Really. You know, the first time I came here was in the 1930s. I was very young and very shy. Thank you, Mother. No, you can't believe that, can you? Well, it's true. I was very young and very shy. Anyway, the first Saturday night I was in Wigan, I decided to go to the local dance hall. You remember the old majestic ballroom in Wigan Shore Street? There's a multi-storey car park there now. It was a lovely place, always full of beautiful girls. The ballroom, not the car park. <laughs> of course, most of them are grandmothers now. <laughs> oh, you were there too, were you, love? I was much too shy to ask anyone for a dance. So I sat down at a table and I thought I'd watch for a while. You know, see how the other ladies did it. At the next table, there was a lovely girl in a blue dress. She'd arrived with a friend, but her friend was dancing with someone. This bloke came over to her. He was very posh, wearing a dinner jacket and a bow tie. Well, he walked up to her and said, Excuse me, may I have the pleasure of the next dance? She looked up at him. She had lovely big blue eyes and said, Hey? What did you say? <laughs> so he said, I wonder if you would be kind enough to dance with me. Ah, uh, if you don't mind. Eh, no thank you very much, she replied. A few minutes later, this other chap arrived. He had a blue suit, a nice tie, and a little moustache. He gave her this big smile and said, Would you be so kind as to have the next dance with me? Pardon, she said. I thought to myself, she's a bit deaf, or maybe she hasn't washed her ears recently. Would you mind having the next dance with me, he said, a bit nervous this time. Eh, no thanks, love. I'm finishing me lemonade, she replied. Blimey, I thought, this looks a bit difficult. Then this third fella came over. He was very good looking, you know, black teeth, white hair. Sorry, I mean, white teeth, black hair. May I ask you something, he said, ever so politely. If you like, she answered. Can I, I mean, could I, no, might I have the next dance with you? Oh, sorry, she said. My feet are aching. I've been standing up all day at the shop. By now, I was terrified. I mean, she said no to all of them. Then this fourth character thought he'd try. Would you like to dance, he said. What, she replied. She was a lovely girl, but I didn't think much of her voice. Do you want to dance, he said. She looked straight at him. No, she said. That's all. No. Well, I decided to go home. I was wearing an old jacket and trousers, and nobody would say that I was good-looking. Just as I was walking past her table, she smiled. Uh, dance, I said. Thank you very much, she replied. And that was that. It's our 40th wedding anniversary next week. Polite requests. Mike? Yes? Shut the door, will you? It's freezing in here. Right. Sorry. Karen? Yes? Lend me 20p. I'll have my purse in the office. Oh, OK. Here you are. Thanks. Excuse me, could you pass me the sugar? Oh, yes, uh, of course. There you are. Thank you very much. Can I help you? Oh, thank you. Would you mind putting my case on the rack? Not at all. Uh, oh, there you are. Oh, thank you so much. You're very kind.
Excuse me, it's a bit stuffy in here. Do you mind if I open the window? No, no, I don't mind at all. I feel like some fresh air too. Excuse me, Mrs. Howe, may I ask you something? Yes, Wendy, what is it? May I have the day off next Friday? Well, we're very busy. Is it important? Uh, yes, it is really. It's my cousin's wedding. Oh, well, of course you can. Can I help you, sir? No, uh, I beg your pardon? Can I help you, sir? Oh, no. No, thank you. I'm just uh, looking. Good morning. Good morning. I wonder if you can help me. I'm trying to find a Christmas present for my father. Might I suggest a tie? Hmm, perhaps. Could you show me some ties? Excuse me. Yes? I wonder if you'd be kind enough to get me one of those tins on the top shelf. I can't reach it. Certainly. <clears throat> there you are. Thank you very much indeed. A trip to Spain. Norman Garrard is a trainee sales representative. He's 22 and he works for a company that sells toys. He's going to Spain on business. It's his first business trip abroad and he's packing his suitcase. He lives with his parents and his mother is helping him and fussing. Norman, haven't you finished packing yet? No, Mum. It's all right. There isn't much to do. Well, I'll give you a hand. Oh, there isn't much room left. Is there anywhere to put your toilet bag? Yes, yes, it'll go in here. Now, I've got three more shirts to pack. They'll go on top. But there's another pair of shoes to get in. I don't know where to put them. Put them down the side. Right, I think we can close it now. Right, where's the label? Which label, dear? The airline label to put on the suitcase. Ah, here it is. Now, have you got the key? Which key? The key to lock the case, of course. It's in the lock, Mum. Don't fuss. There's nothing to worry about. There's plenty of time. Have you forgotten anything? I hope not. And you've got a safe pocket to keep your passport in. Yes, it's in my inside jacket pocket. Have you got a book to read on the plane? Yes, it's in my briefcase. And has everything been arranged? What do you mean? Well, is there someone to meet you at the other end? Oh, yes. The Spanish representative's meeting me at the airport. And you've got somewhere to stay tonight? I hope so. Now, everything's ready. I'll just have to get some pesetas at the airport. I'll need some small change to tip the porter, but that's all. Well, have a good trip, dear, and look after yourself. Thanks, Mum. Oh, I nearly forgot. Here are some sweets to suck on the plane. You know, when it's coming down. Oh, Mum! Don't worry. I'll be all right, really. I'll see you next week. Flying to Spain. This is the last call for the 12 o'clock British Airways flight BA412 to Amsterdam. Would passengers for this flight please proceed without delay to gate 17. Scandinavian Airlines announced the departure of the 1205 flight SK-526 to Stockholm. This flight is now boarding at gate 8. Would passengers for the 1210 Iberia flight IB-341 to Madrid please go at once to gate 16, where this flight is now boarding. And Italia regret to announce that their 1215 flight AZ281 to Rome will be delayed for approximately 30 minutes. A 
Olympic Airways announced the departure of the 1230 flight OA260 to Athens. Would passengers on this flight please proceed to gate 19. This is a call for Mr. Gaston Meyer. Would Mr. Gaston Meyer, traveling on the 1245 Sabina flight SN604 to Brussels, report to the airport information desk, please? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Captain Perez and his crew welcome you aboard Iberia flight IB341 to Madrid. I am sorry to announce a slight delay. We are still waiting for clearance from air traffic control. The delay won't be too long, and we hope to arrive in Madrid on time. This is your captain speaking. We are now passing over the English coast. Our Boeing 727 is cruising at a height of 30,000 feet, and our speed is approximately 560 miles per hour. The temperature in Madrid is 18 degrees Celsius, and it is a clear and sunny day. We expect to pass through some slight turbulence, and would recommend passengers to remain in their seats and keep their belts fastened. We are now beginning our descent to Madrid. Would passengers please make sure that their seat belts are fastened and extinguish all smoking materials. We would like to remind passengers that smoking is not permitted until you are in the airport building. We hope you had a pleasant and enjoyable flight. We would like to thank you for traveling on Iberia and we hope to see you again soon. Would passengers please remain seated until the plane has come to a complete stop and the doors have been opened. Here's your tray, sir. Oh, uh, thank you. Would you like something to drink? Uh, yes, please. Some red wine. That's a hundred pesetas. Thanks. Can I pay in British money? Of course. You needn't pay now, I'll collect it later. Spanish national or non-Spanish, sir? Um, I'm British. Would you mind completing this landing card, sir? Right, thank you. Passport, please. Thank you. Where have you come from, sir? London. And what's the purpose of your visit? Business or pleasure? Business. Fine. And how long will you be staying here? Just for five days. Thank you, Mr. Garad. I hope you enjoy your visit. Money, money, money. Excuse me? Yes, miss. How much do you want for this plate? Let me see. Oh, yes. That's a lovely example of Victorian brass. It's worth 20 quid. 20 pounds? Well, that's too much for me. It's a pity. It's really nice. Ah, oh, I said it's worth 20 quid. I'm only asking 15 for it. 15 pounds? Yes, it's a real bargain. Oh, I'm sure it is. But I can't afford that. <sighs> Well, look, just for you, I'll make it 14 quid. I can't go any lower than that. I'll give you 10. 10? Come on, love. You must be joking. I paid more than that for it myself. 14. It's worth every penny. Well, perhaps I could give you 11. 13. That's my final offer. 12. 12.50? All right. 12.50. There you are, love. You've got a real bargain there. Yes. Thank you very much. Inside Story. This is IBC News. Julian Snow, the missing Daily News reporter, was interviewed this morning by Dominic Beale of IBC News in Mandanga. Julian, can you tell us how you were captured in the first place? Well, 
I was on my way to visit a village near the front line. I came round a bend in the road, and there was a tree lying across the road. I only just managed to stop in time. Suddenly, armed men appeared on all sides. What did you do? <laughs> what would you do? I just sat there with my hands in the air. Anyway, they made me get out of the Land Rover and made me lie on the ground. I thought, this is it, they're going to shoot me. I started saying my prayers. What happened next? Well, they searched me. Of course, I didn't have any weapons, just a camera. It's funny, they let me keep it. Then they tied my hands together and blindfolded me. Then they made me get in the back of a truck and lie under some sacks. I've no idea where they took me, except that it was quite a large training camp. I was there for ten days. Were you treated well? Yes, I suppose I was. They let me walk about the camp, and they let me take photographs. But they wouldn't let me photograph any faces. I was able to interview some of the leaders. How did you escape? <laughs> I didn't. They put me back in the truck, blindfolded me again, drove for a few hours, then made me get out, pointed me in the direction of town, and let me go. And what exactly did the guerrilla leaders say about the situation? Ah, well, if you want to know that, you'll have to buy tomorrow's Daily News. Preferences. What are you doing tomorrow night? Nothing. Why? Well, do you like jazz? Yes, I do very much. Which do you like best? Modern or traditional? I like both, really. There's a weather report concert at the Hammersmith Odeon. Would you like to come? Oh, yes. They're my favourite group. Lisa, look over here. They've got a very good selection of Levi cords. Oh, yes. And they've got my size, too. But only in navy blue and black. Which do you prefer? Hmm. I don't like either of them very much. I really wanted green. They haven't got green in your size. Go on. Try a pair on. No, no. I, I prefer to look somewhere else. Have you decided yet? What do you want to see? A moment of peace is on at the Continental. I'd like to see that. Would you really? Oh, I'd rather see war in space. Oh, no. The reviews were terrible. I know, but it sounds fun. A moment of peace is in French, and I'd rather not have to read subtitles. Then how about California Sunset? I'd rather not. I can't stand Steve Newman. Well, you choose. I don't fancy any of them. I'd much rather stay in and watch TV. What do you fancy? I don't know. There isn't much choice, is there? No, there isn't really. What would you rather have? Steak and kidney or place? I can't make up my mind. I'd rather have a hamburger. We can ask for the full menu if you like. No, it's not worth it. I'll have the place. Where have all the fans gone? Good evening and welcome to the Michael Parkhurst Talk About. In tonight's Talk About, we're looking at the problem of soccer's missing millions. Since 1950, attendance at football matches has fallen by nearly 50%. Many clubs are in financial trouble, and tonight we hope to identify the major causes and discuss some possible solutions. First of all, we'll hear from one of soccer's lost millions, Mr. Bert Woods from London, who used to be a regular Chelsea supporter. Stopped going five or six years ago. <laughs> Rather stay at home, watch it on telly. You get a better view. I don't like the action replays. I'm too afraid to go now, really. All this violence, you know. When I was a lad, there was the occasional fight on the terraces, but nothing like you see these days. Old gangs of teenagers who aren't interested in football. Somebody ought to do something about it. These kids aren't real fans. They just come looking for trouble. The police ought to sort out the real fans from the troublemakers. You know... I always used to go with my dad, but I wouldn't take my kids. There's too much foul language. And I don't only blame the kids. There ought to be more discipline at home and in schools.
Thank you, Mr. Woods. Let's go over to Brian Hoof, the manager of Eastfield United, one of our most successful clubs. Brian? I sympathise with Mr. Woods, and there are plenty of people like him. Anyway, we'd better do something about it, or we'll all go broke. The clubs and players must share the blame. Football's big business, and it's very competitive. Winning has become the most important thing. There's too much violence on the field. Referees have to get tougher with players. They should send off players for deliberate fouls. The other problem is television. There's too much football on TV, and they only show the most exciting parts. Goals, fouls, and violence. People are bored when they see the real game. Anyway, the clubs started talking about these problems ten years ago, and nothing's been done. We better not spend another ten years talking. We better do something and do it soon. Our next guest is a young fan, Kevin Dolan, a Manchester United supporter who is 16 years old. What do you think, Kevin? Well, I'm not one of soccer's missing millions. I never miss a match. I've travelled all over the country with United and I've never been in trouble. I blame the media for most of this violence. They only show young people when they're doing something wrong. They ought not to give so much publicity to troublemakers. It only encourages the others, doesn't it? The violence always starts when there's a TV camera near. If they ban alcohol from football grounds, there'd be much less trouble. Thank you, Kevin. Our last speaker is Jimmy McTavish, the ex-Scotland striker, who has just returned from the United States after spending two years with Miami Galaxy. Well, Jimmy, what ought we to do? I agree with a lot of what's been said, Michael, but hadn't we better look at some solutions? I've been playing in the States for the last two seasons, and I haven't seen any violence over there. A football match is a day out for the family. More than half the supporters are women and children, and there are much better facilities. Everybody gets a comfortable seat. There are good restaurants, and there's entertainment before and after the game, and at half time. Football stadiums are old, cold, and dirty over here. We'd better take a good look at American soccer. I think we've got a lot to learn. Entertainment is what football is all about, and we'd better not forget it. Night Flight Captain Cook speaking. Our estimated time of arrival in Brisbane will be 1 a.m., so we've got a long flight ahead of us. I hope you enjoy it. Our hostesses will be serving dinner shortly. Thank you. It was Christmas Eve, 1959, and the beginning of another routine flight. The hostesses started preparing the food trays. A few of the passengers were trying to get some sleep, but most of them were reading. There was nothing to see from the windows except the vast blackness of the Australian desert below. There was nothing unusual about the flight, except perhaps that the plane was nearly full. A lot of the passengers were travelling home to spend Christmas with their families. The hostesses started serving dinner. It was a smooth and quiet flight. The hostesses had finished collecting the trays, and they were in the galley putting things away when the first buzzers sounded. One of the hostesses went along the aisle to check. When she came back, she looked surprised. It's amazing, she said. Even on a smooth flight like this, two people have been sick. Twenty minutes later, nearly half the passengers were ill, dramatically ill. Several were moaning and groaning, some were doubled up in pain, and two were unconscious. Fortunately, there was a doctor on board, and he was helping the hostesses. He came to the galley and said, I'd better speak to the captain. This is a severe case of food poisoning. I think we'd better land as soon as possible. What caused it? asked one of the hostesses. Well, replied the doctor, I had the beef for dinner, and I'm fine. The passengers who chose the fish are ill. The hostess led him to the flight deck. She tried to open the door. I think it's jam, she said. The doctor helped her to push it open. The captain was lying behind the door. He was unconscious. The co-pilot was slumped across the controls, and the radio operator was trying to revive him. The doctor quickly examined the two pilots. 
They just collapsed, said the radio operator. I don't feel too good myself. Can you land the plane, said the doctor. Me? No, I'm not a pilot. We've got to revive them, he replied. The plane's on automatic pilot. We're okay for a couple of hours. I don't know, said the doctor. They could be out for a long time. I'd better contact ground control, said the radio operator. The doctor turned to the hostess. Perhaps you should make an announcement. Try to find out if there's a pilot on board. We can't do that, she said. It'll cause a general panic. Well, how the hell are we going to get this thing down, said the doctor. Suddenly, the hostess remembered something. One of the passengers. I overheard him saying that he'd been a pilot in the war. I'll get him. She found the man and asked him to come to the galley. Didn't you say you used to be a pilot, she asked. Yes, why? The pilot's all right, isn't he? She led him to the flight deck. They explained the situation to him. You mean you want me to fly the plane, he said. You must be joking. I was a pilot, but I flew single-engine fighter planes, and that was fifteen years ago. This thing's got four engines. Isn't there anybody else, he asked. I'm afraid not, said the hostess. The man sat down at the controls. His hands were shaking slightly. The radio operator connected him to air traffic control. They told him to keep flying on automatic pilot towards Brisbane and to wait for further instructions from an experienced pilot. An hour later, the lights of Brisbane appeared on the horizon. He could see the lights of the runway shining brightly beyond the city. Air traffic control told him to keep circling until the fuel gauge registered almost empty. This gave him a chance to get used to handling the controls. In the cabin, the hostesses and the doctor were busy attending to the sick. Several people were unconscious. The plane circled for over half an hour. The passengers had begun to realize that something was wrong. What's going on? Why don't we land? shouted a middle-aged man. My wife's ill. We've got to get her to hospital. A woman began sobbing quietly. At last, the plane started its descent. Suddenly, there was a bump which shook the plane. We're all going to die, screamed a man. Even the hostesses looked worried as panic began to spread through the plane. It's all right, someone said. The pilots just lowered the wheels, that's all. As the plane approached the runway, they could see fire trucks and ambulances speeding along beside the runway with their lights flashing. There was a tremendous thump as the wheels hit the tarmac, bounced twice, raced along the runway and screeched to a halt. The first airport truck was there in seconds. That was nearly a perfect landing. Well done, shouted the control tower. Thanks, said the man. Any chance of a job? <laughs> The junk shop. Justin Wedgwood and Lenny Smith are antique dealers. They've got a very successful business. They travel around the country buying antique furniture and paintings from junk shops and from elderly people, and then they sell them from their shop in Kensington, a fashionable part of London. Today they're in a small Welsh town. Justin's just come out of a little junk shop, and he seems very excited. Lenny, we're in luck. There's a painting in there, a landscape. It's a good one. I thought it might be valuable, so I had a good look at the signature. It isn't very clear. I think it may be a constable. A constable? It can't be. They're all in art galleries. They're worth a fortune. Well, someone found one two years ago. This might be another. It's dirty and it isn't in very good condition. How much do you think it's worth? I don't know. It may be worth a hundred thousand. It might even be worth more. Be careful, Justin. We'd better use the old trick. Right. There's a chair in the window. It must be worth about five pounds. I'll offer the old lady fifty quid for it. She'll be so pleased that she won't think about the painting. Don't say you want the painting. Say you want the frame, OK? Fine. You'd better wait in the van. I'd rather do this on my own. Uh, Justin, 
Check the signature before you give her 50 quid for the chair. Don't worry, Lenny. I know what I'm doing. I'll be with you in a minute. Now, hello. I'm interested in that chair in the window. What? That dull thing? It's been there for years. Has it? Uh, it's very nice. I think it could be Victorian. Really? Yes, I think I'm right. I've seen one or two other chairs like it. I think I could get a good price for that in London. I'll offer you, um, 50 pounds. 50? You must be madman. No, no, it's a fair price. Well, then, it's yours. There you are, then. 50 pounds. <coughs> Goodbye. Oh, um, oh, by the way... That painting's in a nice frame. It's a nice picture, dear. Early 19th century, I've heard. Oh, no, no, it can't be. I've seen lots like it. It must be 20th century. There's no market for them. Still, I could use the frame. All right. How much will you give me for it? Um, how about 20 pounds? Oh, no, dear. It must be worth more than that. It came from the big house on the hill. Did it? Let me have another look at it. Yes, the frame is really nice. Ah, I'll give you a hundred. Oh, dear. I don't know what to do. You see, I like that painting myself. All right. A hundred and twenty. That's my final offer. Shall we say a hundred and fifty? Okay. It's a deal. Shall I wrap it for you? No, no. I've got the van outside. It was nice doing business with you. Goodbye. Bye-bye, dear. Thank you. Owen! Yes, my love? I've sold another of your imitation constables. You'd better bring another one downstairs. If the paint's dry. The gentleman who bought it seemed very pleased with it. Noisy neighbours. Sydney? Sydney, wake up. Eh? What? What's the matter? Can't be eight o'clock already. No. It's half past one. It's those people next door again. Listen. Oh, yes. They must be having another party. Listen to that. They must be waking up the whole street. And they've got three young children. They can't be sleeping through that noise. It's disgusting. Somebody should call the police. Sydney, wake up. Yeah, I wasn't asleep, dear. They're all laughing. They must be having a good time. They never invite us, do they? Sydney. Yes, dear, what is it now? Listen, they must be leaving. Oh, thank goodness for that. Maybe we'll get some sleep. I hope so. It's nearly three o'clock. Good night, dear. Well, hell, they're having a row now. I'm not surprised. They always have rows after parties. Oh, they must be throwing the pots and pans again. Oh, no. I think that was a plate, dear. Or maybe the television. They'll be sorry in the morning. Sydney, wake up. Eh? Oh, what's that? It can't be hammering at this time of night. What time is it? Four o'clock. What can they be doing at four o'clock in the morning? I can't hear any voices. Go back to sleep, Sybil. Sydney, listen. There's someone in the garden next door. Mm. It must be the milkman. No, it can't be. It's too early. It's only quarter to five. Who could it be? You'd better have a look. All right. Oh, it's Mr Sykes. And he's carrying a spade. Oh, no. You don't think he's killed her, do you? Well, we haven't heard her voice for a while. You know, she's probably sleeping. What can he be doing at this time of night? If he has killed her, he might be burying the body. What? You don't think so, do you? Well, he can't be planting potatoes, can he? I suppose you want me to phone the police. No. Ask him what he's doing first. Hello there, Mr Sykes. You're up early this morning? I haven't been to bed yet. <laughs> we had a party last night. Hope we didn't keep you awake. 
Oh, no, we didn't hear anything. Nothing at all. Well, it was a pretty noisy party. <laughs> My wife knocked over the goldfish tank while we were clearing up. The poor fish died. I'm just burying them before the children wake up. You're in the army now. It's Saturday afternoon at Botherington Army Camp. The new recruits are supposed to be working, but they aren't. The colonel's away today and they're lazing around in the barracks. The sergeant major has just opened the door. He's brought the duty roster with him, so he knows exactly what each of them should be doing. Hello, hello. What's going on here? Smith? What are you doing? I'm listening to the radio, sir. And what are you supposed to be doing, Smith? I'm not sure, sir. Well, let me tell you, Smith. You are supposed to be mowing the lawn. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. It won't happen again, sir. It had better not, Smith. And when I come back, Smith, you better be mowing that grass. Do you want to stand? Yes, sir. This isn't a holiday camp. You're in the army, you know. Migration. One of the greatest mysteries of nature is the instinct to migrate. Every year, millions of creatures feel the need to move for one reason or another. Most of us have seen the arrival or departure of migrating flocks of birds. Migration, however, is not confined to birds, but can be seen in reptiles, for example, turtles, frogs, insects, butterflies, locusts, fish, eels, salmon, tunny, and mammals, reindeer, seals, lemmings, whales, bats. Many of these creatures succeed in navigating over long distances. How exactly they manage to do this still remains a mystery. There are several possibilities. They may navigate by using one or more of the following. The sun, the stars, the Earth's magnetic field, when a small bar magnet is attached to a pigeon, it is unable to navigate. A sense of smell. Geographical features. Birds flying from North Africa to France seem to follow coastlines and valleys. Changes in temperature. Salmon can detect a change in water temperature as small as 0 0.03 degrees centigrade. Sound. Whales and bats seem to use sonar. Experiments suggest that these navigational abilities are partly instinctive. In one famous experiment, a young seabird from the island of Skokholm off the Welsh coast was taken across the Atlantic by plane to Boston, 5,100 kilometers away. It was released and was back in its nest 12 and a half days later. This seabird holds the record for long-distance migration. Arctic tern breed in northern Canada, Greenland, northern Europe, Siberia and Alaska. In late August, they set off on a 17,500-kilometer journey, which takes them south, past the west coasts of Europe and Africa, to the tip of southern Africa, 14,000 kilometers in 90 days. They then fly round to the Indian Ocean and down to Antarctica, where they spend the Antarctic summer. On the way back, they sometimes make a complete circuit of Antarctica before returning to their breeding grounds. The round trip is over 35,000 kilometers in eight months, 240 kilometers a day when they're flying. The Arctic Tern sees more hours of daylight than any other creature because it experiences two summers a year, one in the Arctic region and one in the Antarctic. These regions have almost constant daylight in summer. One tern, which was ringed in Norway as a chick, died in exactly the same place 27 years later. Presumably, it had made the journey 27 times. European freshwater eels, which look like snakes but are really fish, begin and end their lives in the Sargasso Sea, southeast of Bermuda. As eggs and larvae, they drift for three years towards Europe changing both shape and color as they reach the freshwater estuaries of European rivers. 
they spend the next nine to nineteen years in rivers, streams, lakes and ponds. As they approach old age, they seem to have an unexplained compulsion to return to the Sargasso Sea to breed. Many eels which have found their way into ponds and lakes come out of the water and travel overland, gliding through damp grass. When they reach the sea, they make their way to the Sargasso, where they breed and die. No eels make the journey twice. The eel has an acute sense of smell, which is used for navigation in local waters, but inherited memory seems the only explanation for their migration to the Sargasso. The brown lemming is a small mammal, 10 to 18 centimeters long, found all over northern Canada, Scandinavia, and northern Russia. Lemmings usually make short annual migrations in spring, traveling by night and feeding and sleeping by day. Every three or four years, however, they make much longer migrations in large numbers. The lemming population seems to change over a three or four year cycle from one lemming per four hectares to between 400 and 700 lemmings per four hectares. Migration seems to be a method of population control and is most spectacular in the well-known mass suicides where thousands of lemmings plunge over cliff tops into the sea and swim till they die of exhaustion. These mass suicides only occur infrequently and then only in Norway where mountains touch the sea. Nobody knows what makes them do it, but there are two theories. One is that migrating lemmings cross rivers and lakes and can't tell the difference between a river and the sea. The other more interesting theory is that they are migrating towards ancient breeding grounds which existed beneath the North Sea millions of years ago when the sea level was lower. Murder at Gurney Manor. Lord Gurney was found dead on the library floor of his country house in Norfolk. He had been shot five times. The police have been called. There are six people in the house and they all heard the shots at about nine o'clock. The police have taken statements and made the following notes about each of the six people. I was in my room. My bedroom's on the ground floor because I can't walk. I was reading. I heard the shots. There were four or five. I wheeled myself into the hall. The door of the library was open. Miss Smart was standing in the doorway, screaming. Gillespie was standing at the French windows. The gun was on the floor by the body. I was in the drawing room, writing some letters, job applications, actually. I heard the shots, ran across the hall. The library door was open. Poor dear Horace was lying in a pool of blood. I started screaming. Gillespie came in through the French windows. They were opened. Then Lady Agatha arrived. She didn't say a word. She just stared at me. I was in the billiard room. I was practicing. <laughs> Suddenly there were five shots. I thought it was Chivers shooting birds in the garden again. Then I heard a scream. It sounded like Celia, so I opened the connecting door to the library and saw Father lying there, Gillespie at the window, and Celia and Mother together in the main doorway. I couldn't believe my eyes. I was by the lake fishing in my usual place. When I heard the shots, I hurried through the trees towards the house. I saw Gillespie running across the lawn towards the library. When I got there, everybody was in the room except Tom Giles, the gardener. Poor old Gurney was dead. I was absolutely sure he was dead. After all, I was in the army for 20 years. I was taking my evening walk. I had just come out of the kitchen door. I was walking round the corner of the house when I heard shooting. I ran across the lawn to the French windows. I saw Lord Gurney's body and Miss Smart in the doorway. I was working in the kitchen garden. I heard shots, but that's not unusual around here. 
Lord Gurney and the Major are very fond of shooting. And I heard lots of screaming and shouting, so I went into the house through the kitchen door to see what was happening. And they were all there. I wasn't sorry. He deserved it. Everybody hated him. Murder at Gurney Manor, part two. Inspector Marples is in charge of the case. Sergeant Watts is his assistant. They're in the library. Where is everybody, Sergeant? They're all in the drawing room, sir. Constable Dixon's with them. What do you think, sir? It could have been any one of them, couldn't it? We don't know what skeletons are in the cupboard. May have been two of them together. Might even have been all of them. Nobody seems very sad. No, sir. Lord Gurney was a very unpopular man in the village. Nobody liked him. It could have been an outsider. No, no, Watts. It must have been one of them. Let's look at the evidence. It seems to me that everybody has got a motive, sir, and nobody's got an alibi. They all say they were alone when it happened. Yes, and there are no fingerprints on the gun. It couldn't have been her, sir. Why not, Watts? Well, she's in a wheelchair. She can't move very fast. Anyway, they've been married for 35 years. Can't have been her. Most murders are inside the family, Watts. And there is a door between her room and the library. Oh, yes, sir. But it was locked. Doors have keys, Watts. But why would she want to kill him? Miss Smart's a very attractive young woman. We don't know what was going on. She could have been jealous. But, sir, he was over 60. He was old enough to be her father. Ah, well, Watts. He was a good-looking man and very rich. What about the Major, Watts? He's a strange fellow. I've been thinking about that. It can't have been him, sir. Really? Why not? Why would he need to fire five times? He was an army pistol champion. He could have killed him with one shot. Maybe he did, Watts. Maybe he did. I don't understand, sir. There are a lot of things you don't understand, Watts. Perhaps he's more clever than he looks. But there's no motive, sir. There may have been. I mean, there was that scandal with the property company. But he was at the lake, sir. He might not have been, Watts. He's a pistol champion. He could have shot him from the trees and thrown the gun into the room. Oh. Do you really think so, sir? I don't know, Watts. It's just a theory. Making a complaint. Good morning, miss. I'd like to speak to the manager. I am the manager, sir. How can I help you? Oh, really? It's this radio. It doesn't work. Hmm. Did you buy it here? Pardon? Of course I bought it here. Look, you switch it on, and nothing happens. Could I see your receipt? Receipt? I haven't got one. Oh, you should have obtained a receipt when you bought it. I probably did. I must have thrown it away. Ah, well, have you got any other proof of purchase? The guarantee, for example? No. It must have been in the box. I threw that away, too. Oh, dear. You really ought to have kept it. We need to know the exact date of purchase. What? I only bought it yesterday. That young man over there served me. Oh, I paid by check. I've got the check stub. That's all right, then. Did you check the radio before you left the shop? Check it? No, it was in the box. I expected it to work. It wasn't a cheap radio. It's a good make. You should have checked it. Come on, stop telling me what I should have done and do something. Either give me my money back or give me another radio. There's no need to get aggressive, sir. Let me look at it. Mm. You see this little switch on the back? Yes. It's on mains and it should be on battery. You really should have read the instructions. Oh. The Mary Celeste. Part One. The Mary Celeste was built in 1861 in Nova Scotia, Canada, as a cargo carrying sailing ship. When it was launched, it was given the name the Amazon. It was not a lucky ship. The first captain died a few days after it was registered, 
and on its first voyage in 1862, it was badly damaged in a collision. While it was being repaired in port, it caught fire. In 1863, it crossed the Atlantic for the first time, and in the English Channel, it collided with another ship, which sank. The Amazon was badly damaged itself. Four years later, in 1867, it ran aground on Cape Breton Island off the Canadian coast. The ship was almost completely wrecked and had to be rebuilt. It was then sold and the name was changed to the Mary Celeste. Sailors are very superstitious and dislike sailing on ships which have been unlucky or which have changed their names. Many sailors refuse to sail on the Mary Celeste. On November the 5th, 1872, the Mary Celeste left New York carrying a cargo of commercial alcohol to Genoa in Italy. There were 11 people on board, Captain Briggs, his wife and two-year-old daughter, and a crew of eight. Briggs was an experienced captain and a very religious man. In his cabin, there was a harmonium which was used for playing hymns. A month later, the Mary Celeste was seen by another ship, the Dei Grazia, about halfway between the Azores and the Portuguese coast. Captain Morehouse of the Dei Grazia, a friend of Captain Briggs, noticed that the ship was sailing strangely. When the Mary Celeste did not answer his signal, he decided to investigate. He sent a small boat to find out what was wrong. The Mary Celeste was completely deserted. The only lifeboat was missing. All the sails were up and in good condition. All the cargo was there. The ship had obviously been through storms. The glass on the compass was broken. The windows of the deck cabins had been covered with wooden planks. There was a metre of water in the cargo hold which was not enough to be dangerous. The water pumps were working perfectly. There was enough food for six months and plenty of fresh water. All the crew's personal possessions, clothes, boots, pipes and tobacco, etc., were on board. There were toys on the captain's bed. There was food and drink on the cabin table. Only the navigation instruments and ship's papers were missing. The last entry in the ship's logbook had been made 11 days earlier, 1,000 kilometres west, but the ship had continued in a straight line. The forehatch was found open. There were two deep marks on the bows near the waterline. There was a deep cut on the ship's rail made by an axe. There were old brown blood stains on the deck and on the captain's sword, which was in the cabin. Captain Morehouse put some sailors on the Mary Celeste, who sailed it to Portugal. There was a long official investigation, but the story of what had happened on the ship and what had happened to the crew still remains a mystery. Captain Morehouse and his crew were given the salvage money for bringing the ship to port. Many explanations have been suggested, but none of them have ever been proved. The Mary Celeste, Part Two. I don't know what happened, but it must have happened suddenly. Why do you think that? Think about it. There were toys on the captain's bed, weren't there? The child must have been playing, and they must have interrupted her suddenly. Yes, that's true. And the food was on the table. They must have been eating, or getting ready to eat. I'll tell you my theory. The lifeboat was missing, right? They could have been practicing their emergency drill. They must have got into the boat and launched it. All right. But what happened to the boat? Ah, they may have been rowing the lifeboat round the ship, and there must have been a gust of wind. Then the ship could have moved forward and run down the lifeboat. That explains the marks on the bows. Come on. They can't all have been sitting in the lifeboat. What about the captain? He should have been steering the ship. Ah, he might have been watching the drill and jumped in to save the others. Apologies. Hello. 
Derek Moore speaking. Oh, hello, Derek. This is Clive. Ah, yes. Did you get home all right? Yes, thanks. But I just wanted to apologize for last night. Don't worry about it. It really doesn't matter. But the carpet, it must be ruined. It was so silly of me to put the cup on the floor. Forget it, Clive. It's all right now. But it must have made an awful stain. Look, it's nothing. I was annoyed last night, but it doesn't look so bad this morning. Anyway, you must let me pay for the cleaning. Listen, Clive. Accidents happen. They always do at parties. I don't want to hear any more about it, right? All right. I really am very sorry. See you on Monday. Bye. Excuse me. Yes? Would you mind putting out your cigarette? I beg your pardon? This is a no-smoking compartment. Is it? I didn't see a sign. There it is, on the window. Oh, yes. I'm terribly sorry. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Newbury. Good afternoon, Sharon. Late again? Oh, yes. I'm ever so sorry. I couldn't find a parking place. Perhaps you should have left home earlier. Yes, I know. It won't happen again. It had better not, Sharon. This is the third time this week. Oi, you. Me? Yes, you. What do you think you're doing? Pardon? I'm just waiting for the bus. Well, there's a queue, you know. Is there? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to push in. I didn't realize there was a queue. Are you okay? Yes, I'm all right, but what about my car? There's not too much damage. What? Just look at it. I only bought it last week. You shouldn't have been going so fast. Well, I'm sorry, but it wasn't my fault. Wasn't your fault? What do you mean? I had right of way. I'm afraid you didn't. You shouldn't have come out like that. Why not? There's no sign. What's that there, then? Oh, yes. A stop sign. I must have missed it. Well, you should be more careful. You could have killed us all. Yes. I I'm sorry. What more can I say? All right. All right. At least nobody's hurt. Here come the police. You better explain it to them. They didn't stop to tell me. Inspector Waterman is interviewing Stan Fletcher, the driver of the hijacked truck. Sit down, Mr. Fletcher. Cigarette? Uh, no, thanks. I'm trying to stop smoking. Now, Mr. Fletcher, how did you manage to lose your truck? You know the story already. Well, tell us again. OK. I was driving down the M6 from Scotland, carrying whiskey, in cases. Mm -hmm. I decided to stop at Burnham Wood. Why Burnham Wood? I stopped to get some diesel, and I needed a coffee. I've been driving for three hours. Go on. After I'd filled a tank, I parked outside the cafe. Yes. I got my coffee and sat by the window to keep an eye on the truck. Did you see anybody near the lorry? No. Nobody. Then I went to make a phone call. A phone call? Yes. You can check. I stopped to get some change at the cash desk. OK. Then? Well, I... Uh, I was talking to my wife on the phone when I saw the lorry going past the window. I couldn't believe my eyes. I dropped the phone and ran outside, but it was too late. Had you remembered to lock the cab door? Yes. I always remember to lock it. I'm not stupid, you know. All right, all right. But can you actually remember locking it on this occasion? Yes, definitely. How can you be so sure? Well, I remember putting the key in the lock. It was all wet and dirty. 
It was raining, you see, and I dropped it in a puddle. And the passenger door? Did you remember to check that? I don't actually remember checking it, but I'm sure I must have done. It locks from the inside, and I never use that door. But you don't remember checking it? No, not really. But you can't remember everything, can you? I might have forgotten to check it. So it could have been open? Yes. Yes, it could have been, but I bet it wasn't. Well, what's your theory, Mr Fletcher? They must have had keys, mustn't they? They started the engine, didn't they? How did they get the keys? Don't ask me. I've got no idea. They didn't stop to tell me. Kidnapped. Hugh Rowland is a wealthy businessman. His wife phoned him an hour ago to tell him that their daughter hadn't returned home from school. He told her not to worry and came home at once. He's just arrived to find his wife in tears. Pamela, <laughs> what's wrong? Is it Caroline? Yes. This note came through the door. She... she... she's been kidnapped. Kidnapped? Oh, my God, no. <laughs> Have you phoned the police? No. No. Don't touch the phone. Read the note first. Half a million pounds. It'll take me a few days to get that much cash together. How long? I don't know. I just can't put my hands on that much money. Not immediately. Maybe we should phone the police. No, not the police. If the kidnappers find out, they'll kill her. But I'll have to borrow the money. If I don't tell the police, the bank won't let me have it. Oh, you. Unless we do exactly what they say. We may never see her again. <laughs> you, Roland? Did you get our note? Yes. Have you told the police? No, not yet. You'd better not. When can you get the money? I need a few days. You've got one day. How do we know that Caroline is still alive? You don't. You'll have to trust us. Get the money by tomorrow evening. You'll hear from us again. If you harm a hair on her head, I'll... I... Have you seen this advert? Wendy, have you seen this advert? Hmm. It looks great, doesn't it? I phoned them an hour ago. They'll ring me back if they want me. Oh, they'll want you. I mean, you've got beautiful long hair. I hope so. If I go, I'll get a new hairstyle. And a day out in London. Hey, Andrew, look at this ad. Hmm. That looks fun. Why don't you ring? I'd love to, but it's a waste of time. My hair's far too short. Well, I like it the way it is. Anyway, you don't know what they might do. Blue and green hair's fashionable at the moment. Oh, Andrew, I wouldn't mind that. If I had longer hair, I'd phone them. Colin, take a look at this. Oh, yes, I've seen it. Uh, I'm going to phone tomorrow. It sounds very exciting. And you've got a decent car. Uh, th there are some disadvantages. Every job's got disadvantages. But you're always complaining about your present job. I know. I'm prepared to try it. But we haven't got a phone. I won't take it if they don't pay the phone bills. Sandra, did you see this? Yes. You aren't interested, are you? What, me? I wasn't born yesterday. There are far too many things wrong with it. What do you mean? I wouldn't take a job like that. You wouldn't have any security. You wouldn't earn anything if you didn't work all day, every day. And I wouldn't take a sales job if they didn't provide a car. Yes. Look at the address. It's a hotel room. Certainly wouldn't work for a company if they didn't even have an office. Helen, what do you think of this advertisement? Well, didn't I tell you? It was in last week's paper, too. I applied. I've got an interview tomorrow. Do you think you'll get it? They seemed very keen on the phone. I think they'll offer me the job. So, you're going to California. I didn't say that. I won't take the job unless they agree to pay my return fare. 
It'll be hard work with five kids, and I won't go unless they offer me a good salary. There's a job in America in the paper. Yes, I know. I wouldn't dream of applying for it. Why not? We've been looking for a job in the States. It's slave labour, isn't it? Five kids, one evening off a week. But the money might be very good. <laughs> I wouldn't take it unless they paid me a really good salary, with longer holidays and more free time. And I certainly wouldn't go anywhere abroad unless they paid my return fare. Energy Crisis <laughs> Good evening and welcome again to the Michael Parkes Talk About. In tonight's programme, we're looking at the problem of energy. The world's energy resources are limited. Nobody knows exactly how much fuel is left, but pessimistic forecasts say that there is only enough coal for 450 years, enough natural gas for 50 years, and that oil might run out in 30 years. Obviously, we have to do something, and we have to do it soon. I'd like to welcome our first guest, Professor Marvin Burnham of the New England Institute of Technology. Professor Burnham. Well, we are in an energy crisis, and we will have to do something quickly. Fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas are rapidly running out. The tragedy is that fossil fuels are far too valuable to waste on the production of electricity. Just think of all the things you can make from oil. If we don't start conserving these things now, it will be too late. And nuclear power is the only real alternative. We are getting some electricity from nuclear power stations already. If we invest in further research now, we'll be ready to face the future. There's been a lot of protests lately against nuclear power. Some people will protest at anything. But nuclear power stations are not as dangerous as some people say. It's far more dangerous to work down a coal mine or on a North Sea oil rig. Safety regulations and power stations are very strict. If we spent money on research now, we could develop stations which create their own fuel and burn their own waste. In many parts of the world where there are no fossil fuels, nuclear power is the only alternative. If you accept that we need electricity, then we will need nuclear energy. Just imagine what the world would be like if we didn't have electricity. No heating, no lighting, no transport, no radio or TV. Just think about the ways you use electricity every day. Surely we don't want to go back to the Stone Age. That's what will happen if we turn our backs on nuclear research. Thank you, Professor. Our next guest is a member of Kane, the Campaign Against Nuclear Energy, Jennifer Hughes. Right. I must disagree totally with Professor Burnham. Let's look at the facts. First, there is no perfect machine. I mean, why do aeroplanes crash? Machines fail. People make mistakes. What would happen if there were a serious nuclear accident? And an accident must be inevitable sooner or later. Huge areas would be evacuated, and they could remain contaminated with radioactivity for years. If it happened in your area, you wouldn't get a penny in compensation. No insurance company covers nuclear risks. There are accidents. If the nuclear industry didn't keep them quiet, there would be a public outcry. Radioactivity causes cancer and may affect future generations. Next, nuclear waste. There is no technology for absolutely safe disposal. Some of this waste will remain active for thousands of years. Is that what you want to leave to your children? And their children's children? A reactor only lasts about 25 years. By the year 2000, we'll have retired 26 reactors in the UK. Next, terrorism. Terrorists could hold a nation to ransom if they captured a reactor. In the USA, the Savannah River plant, and Professor Burnham knows this very well, lost, yes, lost, enough plutonium between 1955 and 1978 to make 18, 18 atom bombs. Where is it? Who's got it? I consider that nuclear energy is expensive, dangerous, and evil. And most of all, absolutely unnecessary. But Dr. Woodstock will be saying more about that.
Thank you, Jonathan. Now, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Catherine Woodstock. She is the author of several books on alternative technology. Hello. I'd like to begin by agreeing with Jennifer. We can develop alternative sources of power, and unless we try, we'll never succeed. Instead of burning fossil fuels, we should be concentrating on more economic uses of electricity, because electricity can be produced from any source of energy. If we didn't waste so much energy, our resources would last longer. You can save more energy by conservation than you can produce for the same money. Unless we do research on solar energy, wind power, wave power, tidal power, hydroelectric schemes, etc., our fossil fuels will run out and we'll all freeze or starve to death. Other countries are spending much more than us on research. And don't forget that energy from the sun, the waves, and the wind lasts forever. We really won't survive unless we start working on cleaner, safer sources of energy. Thank you very much, Dr. Woodstock. Our final speaker, before we open the discussion to the studio audience, is Charles Wicks, MP, the Minister for Energy. I've been listening to the other speakers with great interest. By the way, I don't agree with some of the estimates of world energy reserves. More oil and gas is being discovered all the time. If we listen to the pessimists, and there are a lot of them about, none of us would sleep at night. In the short term, we must continue to rely on the fossil fuels, oil, coal and gas. But we must also look to the future. Our policy must be flexible. Unless we thought new research was necessary, we wouldn't be spending money on it. After all, the government wouldn't have a Department of Energy unless they thought it was important. The big question is where to spend the money. On conservation of present resources or on research into new forms of power. But I'm fairly optimistic. I wouldn't be in this job unless I were an optimist. What would you have done? Last week we invited readers to write and tell us about things that had happened to them, or things that they had heard about. We wanted stories where people just didn't know what to do next. Here are the stories that interested us most. I was in a small country pub. I just sat down with a pint of beer. Suddenly this huge man, he looked like a boxer, came over, picked up my beer, drank it, banged the glass down on the table, stared straight at me, and then walked away without saying anything. I suppose I should have said something, but I was scared stiff. I didn't know what to do. What would you have done? Mr. A. Watney, Hull. I was on a touring holiday of France. It was a very hot day, and I stopped at a small deserted beach. I hadn't got my swimming costume with me, but it was early in the morning, and there were no people or houses in sight. So I took off all my clothes and swam out to sea. I'm a very strong swimmer. I lay on my back, closed my eyes, and relaxed in the water. When I looked back at the beach, a coach had arrived, and there were thirty or forty people sitting on the sand having a picnic. What would you have done? Mr. T. Horniman, Ipswich. I was told a lovely story about the Bishop of Fleetwood. He'd gone to New York for a church conference. Anyway, when he stepped off the plane, there were a lot of journalists and cameramen. The first question one of the journalists asked was, Do you intend to visit any nightclubs in New York? Well, the bishop was eighty-five years old. Are there any nightclubs in New York? he asked innocently. The next morning, the headline in one of the New York papers was, Bishop's first question on arrival in New York, Are there any nightclubs? How would you have felt? Reverend Simon Fisher, Exeter. My story isn't at all funny. It was a very frightening experience. 
You see, one night I woke up suddenly. I heard the tinkle of broken glass from downstairs, and I thought I heard the window opening and the sound of two voices. My wife had woken up too. She told me to do something. A couple of days before, there'd been a report about a burglar in the local paper. The burglars had been interrupted, and they'd beaten up the householder. They'd nearly killed him. I was trembling with fear. I just didn't know what to do. In the end, I didn't go down, and they stole the silver tea service I'd inherited from my mother. Was I right? What would you have done, Mr. D. Boswell, Edinburgh? I had parked my car in a multi-story car park, and I was taking a short cut through the side door of the restaurant in a large store. Halfway across the restaurant, I spotted my father eating pie, chips, and peas. He often eats there. I crept up behind him, put my hand over his shoulder, took a chip off the plate, dipped it in the tomato sauce, and ate it. Then I realized that the man was not my father. I was so embarrassed. I couldn't say a word. What would you have done, Miss H. P. Branston, Cardiff? I just parked my car in the street near the football stadium in Liverpool. It was ten minutes before the start of the match, and I was in a hurry. Two little boys came out to me and said. Give us fifty p. We look after your car while you're at the match. I told them to clear off, and one of them looked at me with big, round, innocent eyes and said, "Unless you give us the money, something might happen to your car while you're away. You know, scratch or a flat tire, something like that." I was furious. What would you have done, Mr. J. Hill, Birkenhead? I couldn't believe a story I heard the other day. It seems that a couple had just bought a house in Manchester. They wanted to insulate the roof, so they climbed up into the loft. There, under the water tank, was twenty thousand pounds in cash. They handed over the money to the police. Would you have reported the find? What would you have done, Mrs. B. Leyland, Birmingham? A bad day at the office. What was wrong with you this morning? Wrong with me? Sorry, Bob. I, I don't know what you mean. You walked straight past me. You didn't say a word. Really? Where? It was just outside the newsagents in the high street. I'm terribly sorry, Bob. I just didn't see you. Come on, Debbie. You must have done. I was waving. No, honestly, I didn't see you. If I had seen you, I would have said hello. Debbie. Have you sent that telex to Geneva? No, I haven't. Why haven't you done it yet? It's urgent. Because you didn't ask me to do it. Didn't I? No, you didn't. If you'd asked me, I'd have sent it. Did you see a letter from Brazil on this desk? Yes, it's here. Oh, good. Where's the envelope? I threw it away. Why? It had some nice stamps on it. I wanted them for my son. He collects stamps. Oh, Gordon! If only I'd known. Yeah, it doesn't matter. No, I'd have kept it if I'd known. What's the matter, Jeff? You don't look very well. No, I've had a terrible cold. I've been in bed all weekend, but it's better today. Hmm. I had a bad cold last week. I know. And you gave it to everyone in the office. I wouldn't have come to work if I'd had a cold like that. Debbie. Yes. Did you type this letter? Yes. Why? Is there something wrong with it? Have a look. This should be four hundred pounds. You've typed forty thousand pounds. Oh yes. I'm ever so sorry. And you've also misspelt the customer's name. It should be Snelling, not Smelling. <laughs> It's not funny, Debbie. If I hadn't noticed it, we could have lost the order. Hi, Debbie. Did you have a good day today? No, I didn't. I'm glad today's over. Everything went wrong. Really? Yes. I made a lot of typing errors. Then I forgot to send a telex, and I offended Bob because I ignored him in the street. Why was that? It was that party last night. If I hadn't gone to bed late, it wouldn't have been such an awful day. I'm having an early night tonight. A Saturday afternoon. <laughs> Gillian felt slightly uneasy as the porter unlocked the gates and waved her through. St Alfred's Hospital was not an ordinary mental institution. 
it was the most exclusive institution of its type in the country. You had to be not only mentally ill, but also extremely wealthy to be accepted as a patient. She parked her car outside the main entrance of the imposing 18th century building. She paused on the steps to look at the superb ornamental gardens and surrounding parkland. An old man in a white Panama hat was watering the flower bed beside the steps. He smiled at her. Good afternoon, miss. A lovely day, isn't it? Yes, it certainly is. Are you a new patient? Oh, not a patient. I'm just here to do some research. Will you be staying long? I really don't know. I wonder if you could direct me to Dr. Carmichael's office. Certainly, miss. Just go through the main door, turn left, walk down to the end of the corridor, and it's the last door on the right. Thank you very much indeed. Dr. Carmichael was waiting for her. He had been looking forward to meeting his new research assistant. He himself had always been interested in the special problems of long-stay patients. Dr. Carmichael was very proud of his hospital, and she was impressed by the relaxed and informal atmosphere. She spent the mornings interviewing patients and the afternoons writing up the results of her research in the gardens. Some of the patients were withdrawn and depressed. Some seemed almost normal. Only one or two had to be kept locked up. She found it hard to believe that all of them had been thought too dangerous to live in normal society. She often saw the old man in the Panama hat. He spent most of his time working in the gardens, but he always stopped to speak to her. She found out that his name was Morris Featherstone. He was a gentle and mild-mannered old fellow, with clear blue honest eyes, white hair and a pinkish complexion. He always looked pleased with life. She became particularly curious about him. But Dr. Carmichael had never asked her to interview him, and she wondered why. One night at dinner, she asked about Mr. Featherstone. Oh, yes, Morris. Nice old chap. He's been here longer than anybody. What's wrong with him? Nothing. His family put him here 35 years ago. They never come to visit him, but the bills are always paid on time. But what has he done? Oh, I'll show you his file. It seems that he burnt down his school when he was 17. His family tried to keep the incident quiet. Over the next few years, there were a number of mysterious fires in his neighborhood, but the family did nothing until he tried to set fire to the family mansion. He was in here the next day. Morris never protested. And that was 35 years ago? I'm afraid so. If I'd had my way, I'd have let him out years ago. But he can't still be dangerous. No. He's had plenty of opportunities. We even let him smoke. If he'd wanted to start a fire, he could have done it at any time. Gillian was shocked by the story. She became determined to do something about it. She wrote letters to Morris's family, but never received a reply. He had never been officially certified as insane, and legally he could leave at any time. Dr. Carmichael was easily persuaded to let her talk to Morris. Morris, have you ever thought about leaving this place? No, miss. I'm very happy here. This is my home. And anyway, I've got nowhere to go. But wouldn't you like to go into the village sometimes? To walk around? To buy your own tobacco? I've never thought about it, miss. I suppose it would be nice, but I wouldn't want to stay away for long. I've spent 20 years working on this garden. I know every flower and tree. What would happen to them if I went here? Gillian realized that it would be unkind to make him leave the hospital. However, she found out that the next Saturday was his birthday. She arranged with the staff to give him a party. They wanted it to be a surprise, and Dr. Carmichael agreed to let him go out for the afternoon. There was a flower show in the village. Morris left at two o'clock. He seemed quite excited. They expected him to return about four o'clock. The cook had made a birthday cake, and the staff had decorated the lounge. Gillian was standing in the window when she saw him. He was early. He was walking up the drive towards the house, whistling cheerfully. Behind him, above the trees, 
several thick black columns of smoke were beginning to rise slowly into the clear blue sky. Holiday USA Can you see yourself riding a cable car in San Francisco? Eating fresh crab and lobster at Fisherman's Wharf? Winning a fortune in the casinos of Las Vegas? Or walking with the stars along Hollywood Boulevard? Transatlantic Airways invite you to spend two unforgettable weeks in the cities of California and Nevada and enjoy the glitter and the glamour of the Golden West. Every city has its own character. San Francisco with the Golden Gate Bridge, Chinatown, cable cars climbing up the steep hills, restaurants serving food from every country in the world. You'll be offered tours to see the scenery of Monterey and Carmel and the breathtaking views from the Pacific Coast Highway. Then you join the Raz Amateurs of Las Vegas, the gambling capital of the world, set in the Nevada desert. Las Vegas never sleeps, and the entertainment is the finest in the world. And from Las Vegas, there's an optional flight over the spectacular Grand Canyon. Finally, you arrive in Los Angeles, home of the movie industry. Sunset Strip, Beverly Hills, and Hollywood all wait to welcome you. You'll be able to choose any number of excursions, the wonderful world of Disneyland, Universal Film Studios, or even a shopping trip to Mexico. This exciting three-center tour offers you a golden opportunity to experience the special atmosphere of the Golden West. Mark and Emma Austin are a young couple in their late twenties. Emma was interviewed about the holiday. On the whole, we enjoyed it very much, but it was pretty tiring. We went on most of the excursions because we didn't want to miss anything. We really felt we needed more time. If we went again, we'd stay longer. We would have spent more time in San Francisco and less time in Los Angeles if we'd known more about the cities. Los Angeles was a bit disappointing. We went on a tour of Beverly Hills to see the Houses of the Stars. Unless you'd studied film history, you would never have heard of most of them. Generally speaking, the hotels, food and service were excellent. We found Americans particularly friendly. We probably took too much luggage. Clothes in the States were so cheap. It would have been a good idea to take empty suitcases. If we'd done that, the savings on clothes would almost have paid for the airfare. Jack and Vera Drake are a retired couple. Jack was asked about the holiday. We'd been looking forward to this trip for years. And it was the holiday of a lifetime. I think we liked Las Vegas most. But two nights were probably enough. If we'd stayed there much longer, we'd have lost all our money. <laughs> we saw Tom Jones at the Desert Inn. <laughs> I've never seen anything like that place. Disneyland is a must for anyone with children. If only we'd had our grandchildren with us. They would have loved it. We went on some of the excursions, and we could have gone on more. But you can't see everything, can you? I didn't think much of American beer, but Californian wine was a nice surprise. We wouldn't have chosen this tour unless it had been escorted. We're both in our seventies, and we couldn't have managed on our own. Everybody was so helpful to us. <laughs> Fly Drive needs freedom, the freedom of the road to explore this exciting country. Fly Drive must be the logical way of seeing the land of the motel and the freeway. America is made for drivers. American cars are easy to drive, comfortable, and petrol is much cheaper than in Europe. A flexible timetable is the ideal way of getting the most out of your holiday. We book your first night's accommodation in a hotel near the airport and deliver your car in the morning. Then you are as free as a bird. Go anywhere, stay anywhere. 
If you wish to prepay your accommodation before departure, we can supply accommodation vouchers for one of the large chain of motels. Boston is the ideal starting point to explore New England. To the southeast are the rocky cliffs and sandy beaches of beautiful Cape Cod, ideal for swimming, sailing, and fishing. To the north is New Hampshire with its green valleys, white steeple churches, and infinite variety of wildflowers. Drive up into Maine, a land of forests and mountains with a spectacular coastline. Drive west across New York State to Niagara Falls, or south through the beautiful rolling hills of Connecticut to a coastline of resort towns and fishing ports. Matthew and Polly Winthrop took their two children on the fly drive holiday. Polly's talking about it. We'd never have gone fly drive unless we'd had the kids with us. Matthew is a bus driver, and it wasn't much of a holiday for him. But I think it's the only way to travel with young children. The distances were much greater than we had imagined. If we had another holiday in the States, we wouldn't try to drive so far. I think we'd cover the longer distances by a plane and then hire a different car in each place. The motels were very well equipped and the children were always made welcome. The motels didn't have much character, but when you're touring, you just need somewhere to sleep. Every room had TV. For us, that was marvellous. We wouldn't have been able to leave the children if there hadn't been a TV in the room. We would never have left them alone for too long, of course. But it was nice for us to go down to the bar for a drink. New England was absolutely fantastic, and would recommend it to anyone. Ian and Chris are in their early twenties. Chris spoke about their holiday. Oh, it, it was really great. We took it in turns to drive, so the distances didn't seem too long. American cars are tremendous. They're so big. One night we couldn't find a motel and we slept in the car. We bought loads of records and clothes. If we'd bought them in England, they'd have cost twice as much. We went in the autumn. They'd call it fall in the States, and the colors on the trees in New England were unbelievable. We wouldn't have chosen this holiday unless we'd liked driving. You spend a lot of time in the car. We intend to go again next year, but we'll go to Miami or San Francisco, <laughs> if we can afford it. I wish... J.C. Mannering? Your call from New York's on line one, sir. Paris has just come through on line two, and I've got a call from Tokyo on line four. Ask them to ring back tomorrow, Judy. Tell them... tell them I'm not here. It's far too late. I wish I wasn't here. I've had enough today. But, sir, they're urgent to all of them. Do you know something, Judy? I wish I was at home now, in front of the television, with a cup of cocoa. Look at that. It's pouring with rain again, and I've got to walk to the station. Typical British weather. It's all right for old Mannering. His Rolls Royce is downstairs, waiting to take him home. Hmm. I wish I had a chauffeur-driven Rolls. I wish I had a car. Any car. I'm going to get soaked tonight. Hello, James. Still here? Yes. I'm waiting to see Mr. Mannering. You don't usually work in the evenings. I wish I wasn't working this evening. There's a good concert on. Oh, well. Perhaps he'll call you soon. I hope he does. Haven't you finished yet? No, I wish I had. I can't go until I've completed this report. Can't you do it tomorrow? I wish I could. But Mannering wants it tonight. Evening, Joan. Evening, Shirley. Oh, I don't feel like working tonight. Neither do I. I hate this kind of work. Why'd you do it, then? I wish I didn't have to, but we need the money. My husband's out of work again. I know what you mean. I wish I'd learned to type or something like that. We can all wish. I left school at 14. I wish I hadn't, but there was no choice in those days. Youngsters have so many opportunities nowadays. I wish we'd had the chances. 
I'd never have ended up as a cleaner. Come on, Shirley. Let's have a cup of tea. Look at that, Sergeant. There are still lights on in the insurance company again. Yes. Looks nice and warm, doesn't it? I sometimes wish I worked there. Do you really? Hmm, sometimes. A nice office, a desk, secretaries everywhere. It can't be bad. And the boss's rolls outside. Hmm. <laughs> Certainly know what they say. The grass is always greener on the other side of the hill. I suppose you're right, Sarge. Hey, that rose is on a double yellow line. Oh, yes. Give him a parking ticket. He can afford it. The happiest days of your life. Some people say that your school days are the happiest days of your life. Here are six people talking about their school days. Sally Jennings works in an advertising agency. I went to the local grammar school. It was an all-girls school and we all had to wear uniform. That uniform, I really hated it. We had to wear white socks, white blouses, matching blue skirts and blazers and one of those, you know, funny little hats. Ooh! And we had to wear ties, really. We didn't mix much with children from other schools. It was a bit snobbish, I suppose. The syllabus was very academic. We never did things like cookery or needlework. I was glad at the time, but I wish they'd taught us a few... a few basics. I can't even make a decent omelette. I didn't like games, either. A lot of girls running round a hockey field on a freezing cold January afternoon. I hated it. Oh, and another thing I regret. I wish the school had been co-educational... I was terribly shy of boys for a couple of years after I left school, simply because I hadn't met many. Freddie Tapper is a successful self-employed builder. He went to a secondary modern school. School? <laughs> I left when I was 15, and I was glad to get out. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to start earning a living as soon as possible, in the real world. Most of the teachers were boring and they didn't seem to understand us. They lived in a different world. They couldn't understand that we didn't want the things they wanted, you know, Shakespeare and all that rubbish. I'd have left earlier if I could. I think teachers are overpaid, and their holidays are too long. I don't know what they're always complaining about. I'm sorry I had to go to school at all. Samantha Wharton is the personnel manager of a department store. I was at a big comprehensive, nearly 2,000 students. Because it was so big, there was a wide choice of subjects, and I liked that. I suppose it was a bit impersonal sometimes. I often wished it had been smaller. But the teaching was very good, and there were lots of extra activities. I played in the school orchestra, not very well, and helped to produce the school newspaper. I think comprehensives could be improved. A lot of my friends left at 16, and they now regret leaving so early. Some of them would have done very well academically, if they'd been encouraged enough. Still, maybe things are different now. William Bunter is a civil servant. He's a senior official in the Foreign Office. I went to Eton, actually. I suppose I had a very privileged education. Academic standards were very high, and I was able to go on to Oxford. The thing I remember most is the comradeship. The friendships I made there have lasted through my life. Sports were very important for me. I believe that team games teach people to work together, and we played every afternoon. There's been a lot of bad publicity about corporal punishment in schools. I was often beaten, but it didn't do me any harm. Maybe young people would be better behaved these days if there were more discipline in schools. My only regret about boarding school is that I didn't get to know my parents very well. I didn't see much of them after the age of eight. I've thought a lot about the problems, but I'd like to send both of my sons to Eton. I've already reserved their places. Joyce Brown is a housewife. I was brought up in the country, and I went to the little village school. We were all together, boys and girls of all ages. It was like one big happy family. It was difficult for the teacher, of course, different ages and abilities, but the older children helped the younger ones. I think it was a good preparation for life. I wish they'd never closed it. My children have to travel four miles by bus to the school in town. My school days were very happy, 
I never passed any exams, but I don't regret going to my little village school. Darren Andrews was at a comprehensive school. He's unemployed. I left last year when I was 18. I passed all my exams, but I still haven't been able to find a job. I wish I'd applied for university, but even with a degree, there's no guarantee of work nowadays. I wish I'd chosen different subjects. I specialised in English literature, history and Latin. I enjoyed doing them, but you see, most of the jobs these days are on the technical side. I think schools ought to give more advice on careers, and there should be more specific job preparation. If I'd known more about job possibilities, I'd have done other subjects. Miss Britton. This is the third and final stage of the Miss Britton competition. We've seen all the contestants in bathing costumes and in evening dresses, and the judges have selected our six finalists. The last stage is the interview, and in this stage, our contestants will be judged on charm, intelligence, and personality. Our six finalists are number 14, Miss Lancashire, number 13, Miss Dorset, Miss Norfolk, number 50, Miss Gwent, number 6, number 30, Miss Strathclyde, and Miss Warwickshire, number 40. Would the first contestant please come forward? This is 17-year-old Grace Field from Lancashire. Just stand there, Grace. You're a shop assistant, aren't you? Yes, I am. What kind of shop is it? It's a clothes shop. We sell children's clothes. It's only a temporary job, actually. Now, first of all, what do you do in your spare time? Well, I like dressmaking. I make all my own clothes and cooking. I do a lot of cooking. That's a beautiful dress you're wearing. Did you make it? Yes, with a little help from my mother. Now, Grace, you said your job was a temporary one. What would you really like to do? Oh, to work with children, definitely. Uh-huh. Last question. If you could have one wish, what would it be? I've thought about that a lot. World peace. Thank you, Grace. Our next contestant is a beauty consultant from Dorset, Victoria Hardy. Victoria's 25. Hello, Victoria. Good evening, Terry. It's lovely to meet you. Hmm, thank you. Have you got any great ambitions, Victoria? Yes. I'd like to sail across the Atlantic. The Atlantic? Alone? No, no. Have you any experience of sailing? Yes, I go sailing every weekend. Is that your only hobby? It's my favourite one, but I like horse riding, too. Good, good. What about one wish? I'd wish for a long life. <laughs> very nice. Thank you very much, Victoria. <laughs> the third finalist is Lynn King, a primary school teacher from Norfolk. You look too young to be a teacher, Lynn. None of my teachers look like you. I'm 21. This is my first year. I see. Tell me about your hobbies. I'm very interested in astronomy uh, and playing the piano. Ah, music and the stars. Ah, very interesting. Have you got any great ambitions? <laughs> You'll laugh, but my ambition is to go to the moon. <laughs> Seriously. Do you think you ever will? Who knows? And if you could make a wish? I just wish for happiness. Next we have Miss and Wee Lloyd, a 19-year-old brunette from Gwent in Wales. What do you do, Miff and Wee? No, Mivanwee. We pronounce it Mivanwee. I'm still at university. What are you studying? Drama. It's also my hobby. Any other hobbies, Mivanwee? Well, I'm a black belt in judo. Oh, dear. I'd better pronounce your name correctly, hadn't I? It's all right. What do you hope to do when you leave university? To be an actress. I'm sure you'll be successful. Would you like to make a wish? Yes. I'd wish for health. I think it's the most important thing in life. Our next finalist from Scotland is Miss Strathclyde, a 23-year-old fashion model, Dawn Munro. Hello, Dawn. Hello, Terry. 
What are your interests? Uh, dancing and uh, photographic work. So you're a keen amateur photographer? No, no. I'm more interested in modeling. I see. What about your ambitions? I'd like to become Miss World. Really? You are ambitious, aren't you? And your wish? I've always wanted one thing, fame. I'd like to see my face on magazine covers. Well, it's certainly pretty enough. Thank you, Dawn. <laughs> Finally, Kerry Talbot, Miss Warwickshire. How old are you, Kerry? Uh, Eighteen. Don't be nervous. Speak up a bit. And do you work? I'm a typist. What do you like doing in your free time? Reading. I, I like reading and swimming. What's your ambition? To have a large family. I love children. And if you had one wish, what would you ask for? It sounds silly, but I'd ask for good luck. I'm very superstitious. Look, my fingers are crossed. Thank you, Kerry. Now, while our judges are making their final decision, we'll take a short break. Now, here to announce the results of our contest is Mr. Derek Chorley, the chairman of EBC. Mr. Chorley. Thank you, Terry. I'm going to read the results in reverse order. Third, for a prize of £5,000 and a weekend in Paris, is number 13, Victoria Hardy from Dorothy. Second, for the prize of £10,000 and a holiday in Spain, is number six, Mervan Lloyd. And now, Miss Britain, with a holiday in California and £20,000, yes, £20,000 is number 30, Dawn Munro from Strathclyde. I never watch beauty contests. They're like a cattle market. I think they insult the intelligence of women. No woman with any self-respect would ever enter a competition like this. I find them totally degrading. I certainly don't take them seriously. They're harmless fun, really. I mean, you see prettier girls every day in shops and offices. But people earn a living from their intelligence or from their abilities. Why shouldn't they make money from their appearance? I occasionally watch them, but I don't think I'd like them if I were a woman. After all, a lot of girls would look just as good with the makeup, clothes and lights. Anyway, beauty's only skin deep. I often feel irritated when I'm watching a beauty contest. The values are false. I always watch them. I like looking at pretty girls. I'd rather watch a beauty contest than a programme about politics. There isn't enough glamour in the world. If you don't like it, you can always switch off the television. Operation Impossible. Ah, oh, 006. I want you to look at these pictures carefully. This could be the most important mission of your life. At last, we've got the chance to break the biggest crime syndicate in the world. Smash. Look at the man in the middle. He's the one we've been after for years. Who is he? We think he's the one that controls Smash. He's certainly the one that ordered the murder of 003. The one that planned the hijacking of the jumbo jet full of world leaders. And he organizes the biggest drug smuggling operation in the world. Do we know his name? We know some of them. Otto Krugerrand. That's the name he uses in legitimate business. Dr. Nader. That's the name he was using in Vienna last year. John Smith. That's the signature he left in a hotel register in Bangkok. Who's the gorilla standing behind him? Ah. Slow job. He's the bodyguard who travels everywhere with Krugerrand. And the only person he trusts. He's an expert assassin. He's the one who fed 
004 to the crocodiles. How charming. What about the woman? Don't you recognize her? No, I've never seen her before. You would have recognized her if she hadn't had plastic surgery and dyed her hair. Think back to Beirut. Not Heidi Schwartz. She's the one who arranged the pipeline explosion and then vanished into thin air. She's also Krugerrand's wife and the only pilot he allows to fly his private plane. Who's the little guy wearing thick glasses? That's Professor Beratsky, the mad scientist who defected from Moldania. He's an expert on laser technology and the first man who's been able to perfect a space laser weapon. Krugerrand is planning to build a private space rocket which could put a satellite into orbit. Do you understand the importance of this, 006? If they got a laser weapon into space, they could hold the world a ransom. That's something which must not happen, 006. Take a look at this picture, 006. It's an oil rig. It looks like it, doesn't it? It belongs to Krugerrand's oil company. It's a rig that's supposed to be drilling for oil in the Indian Ocean. Below it, there's a vast undersea complex. The superstructure looks odd. In fact, it conceals the launch pad they're going to use for the rocket. That must be a radar scanner there. Yes, it's the scanner they'll use to track the rocket, but they can also see anything that tries to get near the rig. It's going to be very difficult to get you in, 006. There's a helicopter pad. We think that would be too dangerous. Look at the helicopter closely. It carries air-to-air -air missiles which could destroy any aircraft approaching the rig. How are we going to do it, then? Go home and pack. We're flying you to Scotland tonight for two weeks of intensive mini-submarine training. That sounds fun. And 006, try not to be late for the plane this time. Operation accomplished. When 006 reached the rig, he climbed up one of the towers. He was looking for someone whose uniform he could steal, but the rig seemed deserted. He went into an empty cabin. As he was looking for a change of clothes, the guard whose cabin he was searching came in. He was surprised to see 006 in his black frogman suit, and 006 had no difficulty in silencing him with one blow to the neck. Fortunately, the guard was about the same size as 006, and the uniform fitted perfectly. There was a pass in the pocket. The pass operated the lift, which went down to the undersea complex. 006 woke up with his hands tied behind his back. His head was throbbing. He was not alone. In the room were Krugerrand, Slowjob, Heidi, and the guard whose clothes he was wearing. And a beautiful girl, whose hands were also tied, was lying beside him. 006 recognized her instantly. She was Pip Kingsley, an American agent he'd met in Washington. 006 looked at his watch. The explosive device he'd put on the rig was timed to explode in 45 minutes. Krugerrand noticed that 006 was awake. Welcome, Commander Fleming. We've been expecting you, he said, smiling. Unfortunately, we haven't got time to show you around. Blastoff is in 40 minutes. Slow job will take you to feed the sharks. They must be very hungry by now. <laughs> I'm delighted to meet you, Krugerrand. I'd be looking forward to it. Thank you for your invitation. I've always been interested in big fish. See you later. I don't think so, Commander. This will be your last mission. Slow job. Take Commander Fleming and Miss Kingsley to the aquarium. Slow job escorted them to Krugerrand's private apartment. One wall was made of thick glass, and behind it, 006 could see the dark shapes of the sharks cruising around. Slow job pushed them up a spiral staircase to a platform above the shark tank. Ladies first, 006 said politely. No, no, after you, replied Miss Kingsley with a smile on her face. You wouldn't refuse us a last cigarette, would you, Slow Job? 006 asked. I don't smoke, Slow Job grinned. 
and you should give up smoking. It's bad for your health. Now come on, slow job. There are some cigarettes and a lighter in my pocket. 006 indicated his jacket pocket. Okay, but don't try anything. Slow job reached into 006's pocket and took out the cigarettes and lighter. He was careful to keep his gun trained on 006 all the time. He took a cigarette out of the packet and pushed it into 006's mouth. He pressed the lighter with his thumb. The sudden force of the flame took him by surprise. At that moment, 006 kicked him in the stomach. He fell backwards and disappeared into the tank. Within seconds, all that remained of him was a red pool of blood on the surface. The lighter had dropped to the floor and was still burning, and 006 was able to burn through the ropes which held his hands. He quickly released Miss Kingsley. He glanced at his watch. We haven't got much time, he said. Can you fly a helicopter? I can fly anything if I have to, she replied calmly. Good. Go and get the engine started and be ready to go. If I'm not there in exactly ten minutes, go without me. 006 ran back to the control room and walked calmly in. Good evening, gentlemen, he said. Krugeran turned, and he was moving his hand towards his pocket when a jet of flame from 006's lighter threw him back across the room. 006 pointed the lighter at Baratsky and Heidi while he pulled every switch on the control panel until it exploded and burst into flames. 006 ran quickly to the lift, but it was on fire. He had five minutes left, and he started to climb the ladder in the lift shaft. He was halfway up when he felt a hand grabbing at his ankles. It was Krugerrand. 006 gripped the ladder tightly, turned, and kicked Krugerrand hard in the face. He fell back, screaming into the flames below. The helicopter was already in the air, hovering about a meter above the pad. 006 leapt onto a wheel, shouting, Take it up! Take it up! The helicopter soared into the sky. A few seconds later, there was a massive explosion as the rig went up. 006 managed to climb into the helicopter cabin. He sat back, reached into his pocket, and took out his cigarettes. He put one in his mouth. Oh, blast, he said. I seem to have forgotten my lighter. You haven't got a light, have you? Student Mastermind. Our next contestant on Student Mastermind is Victoria Bamber, who is a student at Sandpool Comprehensive. I'll just remind you of the rules, Miss Bamber. You have two minutes in which to answer as many questions as possible. If you do not know the answer, you should say pass. I shall then go on to the next question. If you answer incorrectly, I shall then give the correct answer. You will get one point for each correct answer. If two contestants have the same number of points at the end, the one who has the fewest number of passes will be the winner. Are you ready? Yes. Can you name the President of the United States whose early career was in Hollywood? Uh, Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Correct. What is an instrument which shows the direction of north? A compass. Correct. Can you tell me the name of the sea where eels go to breed and die? Uh, pass. Name the person who became the first woman Prime Minister of Britain. Mary, oh, sorry, uh, Margaret Thatcher. I'll accept that. What is the date when the United States celebrates its independence? The 4th of July. Correct. What do we call a person who always expects the best to happen? Uh, an optimist. Correct. Can you tell me the language which was spoken in the Roman Empire? Italian. No, wrong. The correct answer is Latin. What is the office people visit when they want advice about their marriage? Pass. Who was the Egyptian queen whose beauty was famous throughout the world? Cleopatra. That's correct. What's the newspaper column where jobs are advertised? Uh, the job adverts. Can you be more exact? No, I can't think of it. I'm afraid I can't give you that. We were looking for situations vacant. Now, can you tell me... I've started, so I'll finish. Can you tell me the name of the French emperor whose final battle was at Waterloo? Napoleon Bonaparte. Correct. And at the end of that round, Victoria Bamber has scored seven points. You passed on two. The sea where eels go to breed and die is the Sargasso Sea. And the office people visit when they want advice about their marriage is the Marriage Guidance Council. Thank you. Can we have our next contestant, please? Describing things.
British Rail lost property, Waterloo. Oh, good morning. I left my briefcase on the train this morning. I wondered if it had been handed in. Which train, sir? Sorry, the 747 from Bournemouth. Can you describe the briefcase, sir? Uh, yes. It's sort of, um, well, an average size, rectangular, black leather briefcase with brass locks. We've got rather a lot like that, sir. Uh, did it have your name on it? No, not my name. But it's got the initials J.R. near the handle. Hang on then, sir. I'll just go and have a look. Metropolitan Police. My car's been stolen. It's gone. Calm down, sir. Could I have your name and address? Yes, Richard Lockwood, 3 Park Terrace, WC13. May I have a description of the vehicle, sir? It's a 1982 Escort, a silver blue, four door, 1300 GL model. Oh, and it's got a dark blue stripe along the sides and a dent in the near side front wing. Well, what's the registration, sir? PSV439Y. Well, I've got good news for you, sir. It hasn't been stolen. It's been towed away. It was parked in a double yellow line. You can collect it from the police compound. And you'd better bring your checkbook with you. Rebecca Truman speaking. Hi, uh, Mrs. Truman. This is Fox and Connor, the estate agents. I think we've found a house that you may be interested in. Could you tell me something about it? It's in Red Hill, near the station, as you requested. It's a rather attractive four-bedroom 1930s red brick property. It's in very good decorative order with a fitted kitchen. And the garden? There's a large, mature garden. Would you like to view it? Yes. I think it's worth a look. Could you put the details in the post? Describing people. Donna. Well, she's quite a lively, talkative person in her in her late teens. She's fairly tall with uh, a good figure. She's got a heart-shaped face with a small sort of turned-up nose. It's very attractive, really. She's got long, black, wavy hair and uh, blue eyes with very long eyelashes. Her complexion is, well, she's olive-skinned. Her lips are very full and she's got dimples, dimples in her cheeks. Colin, he's a very big guy, you know, well-built, with very broad shoulders. Not fat, really. Really, just well-built. He's in his early thirties. He's got a long face with thin lips. Oh, and a small scar on his chin. He's got very short, fair hair, but with long sideburns and a moustache. Eyes? I haven't really noticed the colour. He wears glasses. He's got thick eyebrows and a kind of a long, straight nose. He's fairly reserved, thoughtful, sometimes even moody. Janet? She's sophisticated. Well-dressed, expensive hairstyle and so on. I'd say she was in her late thirties or early forties, but she looks younger. She's about average height and very slim. Her hair is very blonde, dyed, I think, but I'm not sure about that. It, it's always very neat, not long. She's got pale grey eyes with thin eyebrows. Her face is always sunburned and very well made up. It's an attractive face. Not really beautiful, but very attractive. You know what I mean. High cheekbones, small chin. Oh, and yes, there's a beauty spot on her left cheek. She's a very calm and reliable sort of person. Very sociable and always very, very polite. Robert... Oh, Robert's a wonderful person, really. He's elderly, but not old. Still very lively and amusing. He's probably in his early seventies. He's got white hair, receding a bit, and a small white beard. He's medium build, a little overweight, perhaps. He's got very nice large brown eyes, and he always seems to be smiling. A lot of wrinkles round the eyes. Laughter lines, I think you call them. He's got a very high-lined forehead, which makes him look very intelligent, which he is, of course. Budget Day. The British government normally announces changes in taxation once a year. This usually happens in March, when the Chancellor of the Exchequer reads his budget proposals in the House of Commons. 
He outlines the changes in taxation which will balance government income and expenditure for the next year. Sometimes the changes in indirect taxation take effect immediately. Many people try to beat the budget by guessing which articles will increase in price and buying them before the Chancellor makes his announcement. Hello, darling. You're late. Yes, I went to the garage to get some petrol. But that only takes five minutes, doesn't it? Well, not today. There was a queue halfway down the road. Really? Why? There isn't another oil crisis, is there? No, no. They were all filling their tanks to beat the budget. Everybody expects a big increase in tax on petrol. I bought ten gallons. It says in the paper that they might increase taxes on electrical goods. Perhaps we should buy that new fridge freezer we were looking at. What do you think? Yes, we need one anyway. Well, can you get to the shop at lunchtime? I'm afraid not. Look, we know how much it is. Why don't you write a cheque and send Stuart to buy it? All right, if you're sure we can afford it. It was an Electrolux 1241, wasn't it? Send him to get it at the showroom in Highfield Road. They're headed on special offer. Stuart, switch on the television, will you? I want to hear the news about the budget. Right, Mum. And here are the major points about today's budget again. In order to raise £60 million, the government proposes to increase the duty on tobacco. This will mean an increase of 15p on a packet of cigarettes, which should please anti-smoking campaigners. The Chancellor has also increased the duty on beer, wines and spirits in order to raise an extra £400 million in revenue. The government has also increased petrol tax by 15%, so as to encourage energy saving. Value-added tax has been reduced by 2%, so as to stimulate the economy. This will mean that household goods, televisions, washing machines, fridges, etc. will go down in price. Do it yourself. Well, I'm very impressed by all the work you've done on your house, Mr. Miller. How long have you been working on it? I first became interested in do it yourself several years ago. See, my son Paul is disabled. He's in a wheelchair. And I just had to make alterations to the house. I couldn't afford to pay workmen to do it. I had to learn to do it myself. Have you had any experience of this kind of work? Did you have any practical skills? No. I got a few books from the library, but they didn't help very much. Then I decided to go to evening classes so that I could learn basic carpentry and electrics. What sort of changes did you make to the house? First of all, practical things to help Paul. You never really realise the problems handicapped people have until it affects your own family. Most government buildings, for example, have steps up to the door. They don't plan buildings so that disabled people can get in and out. We used to live in a flat, and of course it was totally unsuitable. Just imagine the problems a disabled person would have in your house. We needed a large house with wide corridors so that Paul could get from one room to another. We didn't have much money. And we had to buy this one. It's over 90 years old, and it was in a very bad state of repair. Where did you begin? The electrics. I completely rewired the house so that Paul could reach all the switches. I had to lower the light switches and raise the power points. I went on to do the whole house so that Paul could reach things and go where he wanted. What else did you do? By the time I'd altered everything for Paul, do-it-yourself had become a hobby. I really enjoyed doing things with my hands. Look, I even installed smoke alarms. <laughs> what was the purpose of that? I was very worried about fire. You see, Paul can't move very quickly. I fitted them so that we would have plenty of warning if there were a fire. I put in a complete burglar alarm system. It took weeks. The front door opens automatically, and I'm going to put a device on Paul's wheelchair so that he'll be able to open and close it when he wants. What are you working on now? I've just finished the kitchen. I've designed it so that he can reach everything. Now I'm building an extension so that Paul will have a large room on the ground floor where he can work. There's a £10,000 prize. How are you going to spend it? I'm hoping to start my own business so that I can convert ordinary houses for disabled people. I think I've become an expert on the subject. A new way of life. On TV magazine tonight, we're looking at people who've given up regular jobs and high salaries to start a new way of life. First of all, we have two interviews with people who decided to leave the rat race. 
Nicola Burgess spoke to them. This is the Isle of Skye. Behind me, you can see the croft belonging to Daniel and Michelle Burns, who gave up their jobs to come to this remote area of Scotland. Daniel was the sales manager of High Vita, the breakfast cereal company, and Michelle was a successful advertising executive. Michelle, can you tell us what made you give up everything to come here? Everything? That's a matter of opinion. A big house and two cars isn't everything. Dan and I both used to work long hours. We had to leave so early in the morning and we came home so late at night that we hardly ever saw each other. We should have come here years ago, but we were earning such big salaries that we were afraid to leave our jobs. In the end, we had so little time together that our marriage was breaking up. So, two years ago, we took a week's holiday in the Scottish Highlands. We saw this place and we both fell in love with it. It was for sale and we liked it so much that we decided to give up our jobs and here we are. How do you earn a living? If you don't mind me asking. We don't need very much. We keep sheep and goats, grow our own vegetables. We've got a few chickens. It's a very simple life and we're not in it for profit. We're still so busy that we work from five in the morning until eight at night. But we're together. We're happier than we've ever been and we're leading a natural life. There must be some things you miss, surely. I don't know. We knew such a lot of people in London, but they weren't real friends. We see our neighbours occasionally, and there's such a lot to do on the farm that we don't have time to feel lonely. At least we see each other now. The motorbike I'm sitting on is a very special one. Special because it's been all the way around the world. It belongs to Luke Saunders, who has just returned to England after a three-year motorcycle journey. Luke, what led you to leave your job and make this trip? I worked in a car factory on the assembly line. All I had to do was put four nuts on the bolts that hold the wheels on. It's done by robots now, and a good thing, too. The job was so routine that I didn't have to think at all. I bought this Triumph 750cc bike second-hand, fitted two panniers on the back, and just set off for Australia. What did you do for money? I had a bit of money to start with, but of course it didn't last long, and I had to find work where I could. I've done so many different things. Picked fruit, washed up, worked as a mechanic. How did people react to you? In India, for example? Everywhere I went, the people were so friendly that problems seemed to solve themselves. There was such a lot of interest in the bike that it was easy to start a conversation. You know, often you can communicate without really knowing the language. Did you ever feel like giving up, turning round and coming home? Only once, in Bangladesh. I became so ill with food poisoning that I had to go to hospital. But it didn't last long. You've had such an exciting time that you'll find it difficult to settle down, won't you? I'm not going to. Next week I'm off again, but this time I'm going in the opposite direction. See you in about three years' time. Last of the airships? At 7.20pm on May the 6th, 1937, the world's largest airship, the Hindenburg, floated majestically over Lakehurst Airport, New Jersey, after an uneventful crossing from Frankfurt, Germany. There were 97 people on board for the first Atlantic crossing of the season. There were a number of journalists waiting to greet it. Suddenly, radio listeners heard the commentator screaming, Oh my God! It's broken into flames! It's flashing! Flashing! It's flashing terribly! 32 seconds later, the airship had disintegrated and 35 people were dead. The age of the airship was over. The Hindenburg was the last in a series of airships which had been developed over 40 years in both Europe and the United States. They were designed to carry passengers and cargo over long distances. The Hindenburg could carry 50 passengers accommodated in 25 luxury cabins with all the amenities of a first-class hotel. All the cabins had hot and cold water and electric heating. There was a dining room, a bar, and a lounge with a dance floor and a baby grand piano. The Hindenburg had been built to compete with the great luxury transatlantic liners. 
It was 245 meters long, with a diameter of 41 meters. It could cruise at a speed of 125 kilometers per hour and was able to cross the Atlantic in less than half the time of a liner. By 1937, it had carried 1,000 passengers safely and had even transported circus animals and cars. Its sister ship, the Graf Zeppelin, had flown one and a half million kilometers and it had carried 13,100 passengers without incident. The Hindenburg was filled with hydrogen, which is a highly flammable gas, and every safety precaution had been taken to prevent accidents. It had a smoking room, which was pressurized in order to prevent gas from ever entering it. The cigarette lighters were chained to the tables, and both passengers and crew were searched for matches before entering the ship. Special materials, which were used in the construction of the airship, had been chosen to minimize the possibility of accidental sparks, which might cause an explosion. Nobody knows the exact cause of the Hindenburg disaster. Sabotage has been suggested, but experts at the time believed that it was caused by leaking gas, which was ignited by static electricity. It had been waiting to land for three hours because of heavy thunderstorms. The explosion happened just as the first mooring rope, which was wet, touched the ground. Observers saw the first flames appear near the tail, and they began to spread quickly along the hull. There were a number of flashes as the hydrogen-filled compartments exploded. The airship sank to the ground. The most surprising thing is that 62 people managed to escape. The fatalities were highest among the crew, many of whom were working deep inside the airship. After the Hindenburg disaster, all airships were grounded, and until recently, they have never been seriously considered as a commercial proposition. The Knowledge Becoming a London taxi driver isn't easy. In order to obtain a license to drive a taxi in London, candidates have to pass a detailed examination. They have to learn not only the streets, landmarks and hotels, but also the quickest way to get there. This is called the knowledge by London cab drivers, and it can take years of study and practice to get the knowledge. Candidates are examined not only on the quickest routes, but also on the quickest routes at different times of the day. People who want to pass the examination spend much of their free time driving or even cycling around London, studying maps and learning the huge street directory by heart. Monty Hunter is taking the examination now. Listen to the examiner's question and try to follow Monty's directions on the map of London. OK, Monty. Ready? You're outside Buckingham Palace and you've just picked up a passenger who wants to go to St Paul's Cathedral. It isn't the rush hour. Use the most direct route. I go straight along the Mall round the one-way system at Trafalgar Square and turn into Northumberland Avenue. I turn left along the embankment and carry on as far as Blackfriars Bridge. Turn left into New Bridge Street, then right at Ludgate Circus and up Ludgate Hill to St Paul's. Travelling on the London Underground, the Tube, presents few difficulties for visitors because of the clear colour-coded maps. It's always useful to have plenty of spare change with you, because there are often long queues at the larger stations. If you have enough change, you can buy your ticket from a machine. You will find signs which list the stations in alphabetical order with the correct fares near the machines. There are automatic barriers which are operated by the tickets. You should keep the ticket because it's checked at the destination. Listen to these people talking about the underground map and follow their routes on the map. Peter and Susan have just arrived at Victoria. <sighs> right. We've got to get to Baker Street. Can you see it? Yes, it's up here. It looks easy enough. We just take the Victoria line to Green Park, then change to the Jubilee line. That goes straight there. It's only the second stop from Green Park.
Laura is at the inquiry office at King's Cross. Oh, excuse me. How do I get to King's Road, Chelsea? I mean, which is the nearest tube station? You want Sloane Square? Take a look at this map. The best way is to take the Victoria line. That's this light blue one, as far as Victoria Station. Then you'll have to change. When you get to Victoria, follow the signs for the circle and district lines. They're on the same platform. Then take the first eastbound train. It doesn't matter which one it is. Sloan Square's the next stop. Thank you very much indeed. Simon and Elizabeth are at Waterloo. Where is a map? There's one over here. They said the hotel was near Russell Square. Can you see it? Yes, it's up here, in the top right of the map. Look, I reckon we should take the Bakerloo as far as Piccadilly Circus, then change to the Piccadilly line. That's the dark blue one. It's only four stops to Russell Square. Are you sure that's the quickest way? We could take the northern line, it's the black one, to Leicester Square and join the Piccadilly line there. There's not much in it, really. Might as well take the northern. Have you got any change for the ticket machine? The 8 o'clock news. Good evening, and here is the 8 o'clock news. 5,000 people marched through the streets of Chesilworth today, protesting against plans for a new international airport near the town. Although there was such a large number of demonstrators, there was no trouble. The demonstrators marched to the town hall where a public inquiry into the plans was taking place and handed in a petition to the chairman of the inquiry. A new airport is needed because the other airports in the London area are overcrowded. Several sites for the new airport have been suggested, and Chesilworth was considered because it is near both a major motorway and a railway line. Although it was a protest march, there was almost a carnival atmosphere, and both demonstrators and police remained good-humoured. Families were evacuated from four streets in the centre of Glasgow today because of a gas explosion. The explosion occurred at 10am in a deserted house in Mickle Street. Gas board officials believed that the explosion was due to leaking gas. The house had been empty for several months and they suspect that a gas main had cracked because of vibration from roadworks in the street. Windows a hundred meters away were broken by the blast. The police have forbidden anyone to enter the area until the gas board has completed tests. SC rescue helicopters from RAF Sopworth were called out after a yacht capsized in a storm off the Devon coast. Despite high seas, the helicopters lowered rescue teams to try and save the crew. Two men and a girl were pulled to safety. Unfortunately, the other two crew members died in spite of the rescue team's efforts. One was lost at sea, the other was rescued and taken to hospital, but was dead on arrival. The Coast Guard had warned small boats to stay in the harbour, but the yacht, the Neptune III from Poole, had set out for France despite the warnings. Fernside Engineering announced today that they are closing their plant in Tadworth. 300 jobs will be lost because of the closure, which is due to a sharp decline in orders for their products. There have been rumours for several weeks that the plant might be closed, and in spite of lengthy discussions between unions and management, closure became inevitable because of the cancellation of several major orders. As well as the 300 redundancies at Tadworth, Union leaders predict further redundancies in the area in firms which supply Fernside Engineering with components. Reports are coming in of a 100 miles per hour car chase through the roads of Hampshire. Police disturbed a gang of men who were breaking into a chemist in Linford. However, the men escaped in a stolen Jaguar saloon and the police chased them through the new forest at high speed. The Jaguar was forced off the road near Bransley. The men were armed with shotguns, but nevertheless, police officers chased them across a field. Several shots were fired. Fortunately, however, no one was injured, and the men were taken into custody. Brighton Bell the 14th, a four-year-old Dalmatian bitch, became the supreme champion dog at Crufts Dog Show in London. There were almost 10,000 dogs on show, 
worth around eight million pounds. There were 120 judges looking at 144 different breeds of dog. Brighton Bell the 14th is expected to earn up to 100,000 pounds in breeding and advertising fees. And last day sport. Eastfield United are through to the next round of the European Cup after an exciting match in Scotland. Dunroman Rangers scored twice in the first half. And although Eastfield were two down at half time, they went on to win with a hat trick by Trevor Franklin in the second half. Towards the end of the second half, Franklin was limping because of a knee injury, but nevertheless managed to score the winning goal one minute from time. The game was stopped twice because of fighting in the crowd. But in spite of the trouble and in spite of the appalling weather, both teams played well. Viewers will be able to see highlights of the match after the news. The annual dinner dance. Every year, Continental Computers holds an annual dinner and dance, to which all employees and their husbands and wives are invited. It is the only time of the year when all the employees get together socially. Christopher Simpson is a young accounts clerk. He's speaking to Edward Wallace, the chief personnel officer. Mr. Wallace, can I buy you a drink? Oh, that's very kind of you, Christopher. I'll have a scotch, a large one. Ice? No, 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 just a splash of soda, please. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, what was happening about the job in Sheffield? It's being advertised next week. Are you interested? I might be. I really don't know what to do. I'm quite happy here, but it would be a promotion. Do you think I should apply? Why not? There's no harm in trying. I'll tell you what to do. Pop up and see me on Monday, and I'll tell you what I can about the job. Martin Weber is a computer programmer. He's at the dance with his wife, Melanie. Melanie? Do you have to flirt with Philip every time we come to a dance? Oh, you were only dancing. There's no need to get jealous. I saw what he was doing. He was whispering to you. Oh, Martin, you don't know what you're talking about. He had to speak into my ear because of the music. How many drinks have you had? Oh, come on. That's got nothing to do with it. Do you want to hear what he said? I don't care what he said. I'm... He was asking me what he should buy for his wife's birthday. That's all. Jacqueline Dibbon works in the marketing department. She's just met Fiona Johnson, who's in charge of advertising. Ah, Jackie. So, you're back from New York. Yes, Fiona. I've been doing market research there. I know. How did you get on? Well, what I saw in the States astonished me. Really. I think there'll be a lot of demand for our new 2CL home computer. That's very interesting. Yes. What I heard was very encouraging. We've got just what they're looking for. Sir Joseph Lennox is the managing director. He's just run into Alex Fielding, one of the union representatives. Oh, good evening, Mr. Fielding. Good evening, Sir Joseph. Did you get my message about the meeting on Monday? Yes, I did. But I'm still not absolutely sure what the meeting's about. Not bad news, I hope. No, no, no. Don't worry. It's good news, in fact. What we'd like to do is expand production of the new home computer. Either we'll have to increase overtime working or take on new staff. That sounds promising. What we'll need to know is exactly how much more work will be created. I'll give you all the facts and figures on Monday, but let's forget about all that now. We don't want to talk shop tonight, do we? That's not what this evening's all about. <laughs> Another drink? Please. Kelly is a secretary, and Teresa works in the data processing department. Hey, Teresa. Wasn't that Neil Pincher you were dancing with? Yes. Do you know what he asked me? No. He invited me out for dinner. You're not going, are you? No fear. I've heard all about him. I wouldn't go out with him if he was the last man on earth. So what did you say? What I wanted to say was, go to hell. But I just told him I was busy. <laughs> The Apprentice. It's Alan Newman's first day in his first job. He started work in an electrical components factory. 
The personnel officer, Mrs. Vaughan, is introducing him to Bert Hogg, who has worked there for 30 years. Alan, this is Bert. Bert Hogg. You'll be working with him. Morning, Mr. Hogg. You can call me Bert, son. Don't worry, I'll show you what to do. Can I leave him with you then, Bert? Oh, yes, Mrs. Vaughan. I'll look after him. Follow me, son. Right, son, any questions? Uh, yes. Now, where can I leave my coat and things? There's a row of lockers over there. It doesn't matter which one you use. Take whichever one you want. Oh, thanks. And uh, I've got my national insurance card here. Who should I give it to? You should have given it to Mrs Vaughan. I don't suppose she asked you for it. Just take it up to the office. You can give it to whoever is there. They'll pass it on to her. But when can I do that? Doesn't matter, really. Take it whenever you like, lad. But I'll give you a tip. Don't take it during the tea break. You know what I mean? Right. Thanks. Oh, another thing. Where can I leave my motorbike? There's plenty of room in the car park. Just don't put it in the numbered space. They're reserved for the director's cars. But apart from that, you can leave it wherever there's room. Come on, I'll show you where you'll be working. This is our bench. Just watch me and do whatever I tell you. OK? OK. First of all, you can clean these tools. There's a bottle of white spirit on the shelf. All right. Is there any special way of doing it? Eh? Hey, special way? No, son, no. Clean them however you want. There's no special way. Oi, Alan! You can stop work for a bit. It's time for the tea break. Oh, thanks. Don't thank me, son. You've done well. You'll need a cup of tea. Oh, look. After the tea break, I want you to go to the stores and get me a few things. Is that all right? Oh, yes. I'll get whatever you want. Good lad. Now, I'll need a tin of striped paint, a rubber hammer, and a glass nail, a left-handed screwdriver, and a bucket of steam. Oh, and tell them Bert sent you. Morning. Morning. I've come to get a tin of striped paint. A what? Whatever are you talking about, son? A tin of striped paint. I want a tin of striped paint. Whoever taught you to come and get that? Bert. Um, uh, uh, Bert Hogg. Oh, Bert Hogg. <laughs> what colour stripes would you like, son? Oh, I'm not sure. Perhaps I'd better ask him. I suppose he asked you to get a right-handed screwdriver as well. No, he wants a left-handed one. Just stop and think for a minute, lad. Just stop and think. Going to the doctors. Good morning, doctor. Hello, Mr. Williams. Take a seat. What seems to be the trouble? I'm not sure, doctor. But I am been feeling too well. I think I must have a touch of flu. Hmm. There's a lot of it going round at the moment. What are the symptoms? I'm feeling very tired, and I'm aching all over. I've been sneezing a lot, and feeling pretty feverish. Hot and cold all the time. Oh, and I've got a sore throat. Any vomiting? No, but I don't, I don't feel very hungry. I've got no appetite at all. Well, let's have a look at you. Open your mouth. Ah! Ah! Yes. Your throat's a bit inflamed. And... The glands in your neck are swollen. Can you just unbutton your shirt? I want to listen to your chest. Breathe deeply. Right, I'll just take your temperature. Don't say anything for a minute. Just keep the thermometer under your tongue. I'll write out a prescription for you, but you know the best thing is just to go home, go to bed, and take plenty of fluids. Wayne fell off his bicycle. He's in the casualty department at the local hospital. Dr. Singh is examining him. Hello. Wayne, isn't it? You've had a bit of a fall. What were you doing? Going too fast? Yes, Doctor. I fell off going round a corner. You'd better get undressed then, and we'll take a look at you. Hmm. 
That's a nasty cut. I'll have to put a couple of stitches in that. I've got a cut here too, Doctor. It looks worse than it is. It's only a graze. The nurse will clean it up for you. It'll sting, but that's all. Now, does it hurt anywhere else? I've got a pain in my arm. It's very sore and it feels stiff. Well, there's nothing broken, but you bruised your shoulder. It'll be sore for a few days. Now, did you bang your head at all? Yes, I did. I fell onto the bike, but it doesn't hurt now. Did you feel dizzy? No, not at all. Look up there. I'm just going to shine this light in your eye. No, that's fine. I'll just do the stitches and the nurse will put a dressing on it. Then you can go home. Mrs. Mallard has gone to see Dr. Gillespie, her family doctor. Good morning, Doctor. Ah, good morning, Mrs. Mallard. What can I do for you this time? It's those pills, Doctor. They don't seem to be doing me any good. Really? What's wrong? What isn't wrong with me, Doctor? It's old age, I suppose. You're doing very well, Mrs. Mallard. You'll live to be a hundred. I've got this terrible cough, Doctor. And I've still got that rash on my hands, and the backache. I can hardly walk sometimes. You don't think it's that legionnaire's disease, do you? I've been reading about it in the paper. No, no, no chance of that. You're very fit for your age. Pardon? Anyway, I've nearly finished the old pills, Doctor. Can you give me a different colour next time? It's about time. Janet and Bruce live in London. Janet's younger sister, Pam, who lives in Edinburgh, is flying down to spend the weekend with them. Bruce, I think it's time to go and meet Pam at the airport. Oh, no, we've no need to hurry. There's plenty of time. It's only half past eight. There won't be much traffic at this time of night. You never know. And I think your watch must be slow. I make it 8.40. And you'll have to stop for petrol. I'd sooner we were too early than too late. It'll take her a while to get her luggage. Oh, come on, Bruce. It's time we were leaving. We can always have a coffee at the airport. <laughs> Anyway, I like watching people at the airport. I'd rather see the end of the football match. But well, never mind. We'd better go. Janet, hold on a minute. There's the phone. You haven't got time to answer it now. Ignore it. No, I'd better see who it is. It might be important. Bruce McGregor speaking. Oh, Pam! We were just on our way to fetch you. Oh, oh, no. Hold on. I'll get Janet. Pam, where are you? I'm still in Edinburgh. The flight's been delayed. You caught us just in time. We were about to leave for the airport. I know. Bruce said so. I'm glad I phoned. You'd have had a long wait otherwise. When would you be leaving, do you think? Oh, not for an hour at least. Look, don't bother to come out to the airport. It's no trouble. We'll meet you. No. I'd rather you didn't, honestly. Now, don't be silly, Pam. We'll collect you. No, Janet. I'd rather get a taxi. We'll be there, Pam. See you later. Oh, it's nearly 12.30. Well, we couldn't let her find her own way. Not at this time of night. She knows how to look after herself. That plane landed half an hour ago. It's about time she was here. It always takes ages to get your luggage. I know. It's about time they did something about it. Last time it took me longer than the flight. Oh, Bruce, there she is. About time, too. Pam! Pam, over here! I'll go and bring the car around. I won't be long. Well, Pam... What would you rather do tomorrow morning? Fly in or go shopping? This morning, you mean? I'd rather go shopping, but there's no need for you to get up and come with me. I'd rather you had a lie in. You must be tired out. I'm a bit tired, but I'll meet you for lunch. There's a new restaurant just off Kensington High Street. 
Do you think you'll be able to find your way there? Oh, Janet, it isn't as if this were my first visit to London. You can tell me where it is in the morning. The circus is coming. This is RW2, Watermouth's own independent radio station. In the studio with me this morning is Sally Farnham, the daughter of circus owner Bertie Farnham. Farnham's circus will be here in Watermouth for two weeks. That's right, isn't it, Sally? Yes, that's right. We open tomorrow for two weeks. Has the circus arrived yet, Sally? No, no, not yet. It's on the road somewhere between Sandpool and here. I suppose there's a lot to be done between now and the first show. Yes, that's right. I've already been here for three days. There were all the advance arrangements to be made. It's like preparing for a small invasion. What sort of things have you done? Oh, there are so many things to be done, you know. There are posters to be put up, newspaper ads to be arranged, casual labour to be hired, and so on. Mm. When will the circus actually arrive? Mm. In the next hour or so. The first truck should be arriving any time now, and then the hard work really begins. Most people love the circus, don't they? But not many realise how much work there is, do they? That's right. We'll be working all day and half the night. It's a bit like moving a small army. But, fingers crossed, by tomorrow morning everything will have been set up in time for the afternoon performance. Oh, there's the Grand Parade through the town centre at 11.30, so don't forget to come and see us. Thank you, Sally, for coming in to talk to us. Now, don't forget, folks, the Grand Circus Parade will start from the pier at 11.30, go along the promenade, through the gardens, and finish in Jubilee Park. Farnham Circus will be in town for two weeks, until the 28th of August. Now for some music. Getting things done. Tim, that bathroom tap's still dripping. It's getting on my nerves. I thought you said you were going to fix it. Oh, yes. The washer needs replacing. Why don't you replace it, then? It's not as easy as that. I'll try and do it next week. But you said that last week. I know. I think you'd better phone for a plumber and get it done. I'm not really quite sure how to do it. Adrian and Susanna are going on a touring holiday of France next week. They're taking their own car. Adrian always gives Susanna a lift to work. He's dropping her off outside her office. Oh, Susanna, I won't be able to pick you up from work tonight. I'm having the car serviced. I thought we'd better have it done before we go. Oh, that's all right. When are you collecting it? Uh, not till quarter to six. Why? Well, I want to have my hair done before the holiday. I'll try and make an appointment to get it done after work. Then you can pick me up from the hairdressers. OK. Can you ring me at work and let me know what time? Right. I'll call you later. Bye. I'm afraid it's been rather neglected. The present owner is in his 80s. He's just gone into an old people's home. Yes. It looks as though a lot needs doing to it. That's true, but the price is very reasonable. It would be ideal for a do-it-yourself man. Hmm. I'm not very good with my hands, I'm afraid. We'd have to get most things done for us, wouldn't we, Jean? Oh, I don't know. Could we see inside? Of course. I'll show you the kitchen first. Oh, dear. Just look at that sink. It must have been there since the house was built. It's a nice large room, though, and there's plenty of light. We'd have to have kitchen units put in, and we'd need to get it tiled. But you could do the ceiling yourself, couldn't you? And the painting. Is that the only PowerPoint there? I'm afraid so. It looks pretty old. I'm sure the whole place would need rewiring. Mm. We certainly couldn't do that ourselves, and we'd need to have more points put in at the same time. Would you like to see the lounge? It's through here. Oh, my God. It'd certainly need redecorating. I suppose we could do the painting and wallpapering. What's it like upstairs? Pretty bad, really. It obviously hasn't been decorated for years. And as I told you on the phone, it hasn't got a bathroom. But you could have the small bedroom converted into a bathroom and get a grant towards the cost. All the other houses in the street have had that done. What about the toilet? 
I'm afraid that's outside, but you could get one put in the new bathroom. And, of course, uh, you get a grant for that as well. Is there anything else that needs doing? Well, you'd probably have to get the roof repaired pretty soon. The sooner the better, if you ask me. It looks as though water's been coming in over there. And, of course, we'd want to have central heating put in, and the windows double-glazed. It's a very noisy street. I couldn't do any of that myself. Of course not. Uh, anyway, thank you for showing us around. But really, I think the best thing would be to knock it down and start all over again. Don't panic. Don't forget to fasten your seat belts. Please do not leave your seat while the warning light is on. May we remind passengers to read the emergency procedures. Please do not smoke in the aisles or in the toilets. Would you like to see the flight deck? I'm busy now, but I'll bring you a drink in a minute. I'm afraid I can't give you another drink, sir. Here's the headset. Let me help you. Please keep your belts fastened. We're going through turbulence. Remove your shoes and proceed at once to the emergency exits. Come on, dear. You can make it. Just slide down the chute. I'll have to push you. Messages. Amanda Haywood is a secretary at Standard Security Systems. Her boss, Peter Dawson, was away on business on Monday. She took several messages for him. Listen to the conversations and look at the notes. Nine o'clock. Mr. Dawson's office. Oh, it's Jenny. C can you give Mr. Dawson a message? I won't be until Friday. I've got flu. I saw the doctor this morning. Okay, Jenny. I'll pass the message on. I hope you feel better soon. Nine forty. Mr. Dawson's office. Can I help you? May I speak to Mr. Dawson, please? I'm afraid he's away on business. He'll be back tomorrow. Can I take a message? Please. It's uh, Tom Watkins here. Look, I can't make the meeting on Tuesday afternoon. Something important's come up. I'll ring Peter on Wednesday. 11.30. Hello, Godfrey. What can I do for you? Mr. Dawson isn't here, is he? No, not till tomorrow. Ah, it's just that I want Friday off. You see, my grandmother died yesterday. I'll have to go to the funeral. Oh, I am sorry. How old was she? Ninety-two. Twelve-fifteen. Mr. Dawson's office. Can you put me through to Mr. Dawson? I'm afraid he isn't here today. Would you like to leave a message? Oh, right. Wadley's garage here. It's about his new car. It isn't ready yet. There's a strike at the factory today. Two-ten. Good afternoon. Mr. Dawson's office. Good afternoon. This is Juliet Dobson from Western Video Systems. Mr. Dawson's at the trade fair in Lyon, isn't he? Yes, that's right. He should be here tomorrow. Well, can you give him this message first thing in the morning? I'm afraid we must cancel our last order. The customers have changed their minds again. 3.20. Good afternoon. Mr. Dawson's office. Hello, this is Miguel Gonzalez speaking. Is Peter there? No, I'm afraid he's away on business today. Can I pass on a message, Senor Gonzalez? Yes. I may be in London from the 21st to the 25th. I want to see Peter then, if possible. It's about the agency in Mexico. 4.35. Mr. Dawson's office. Uh, my name's Samantha Ellis. Can you get Mr. Dawson to phone me as soon as he gets back from Lyon? It really is very urgent. 4.55. Mr. Dawson's office. Ah, Miss Hayward. This is Charles Berry. Oh, good afternoon, sir. I've got an important message for Mr. Dawson. Give it to him the minute he comes in. Just say, don't supply Mason and Company until further notice. I'll explain later. It's Tuesday morning. Peter Dawson has just returned to the office after his business trip to Lyon. Look at the notes and listen to her report. 
Good morning, Amanda. Could you come in for a minute, please? Good morning, Mr. Dawson. Did you have a good trip? Yes, thank you. Were there any messages for me yesterday? Yes, quite a few. Shall I just run through them? Please. Jenny phoned. She said she wouldn't be in till Friday. Oh. Why is that? She said she had flu. She'd seen the doctor. Right. Go on. Then Mr. Watkins called. He said he couldn't make the meeting this afternoon, but would ring you on Wednesday. OK. Godfrey came in looking for you. He said he wanted Friday off. Did he? Yes. He told me his grandmother had died and he'd have to go to the funeral. Oh, dear. I'd better see him later. And Waddle's garage called. They said your new car wasn't ready. Oh, no. Why on earth not? They said there was a strike at the factory yesterday. Again? After lunch, Miss Dobson phoned. She said that Western Video Systems had to cancel their last order because their customers had changed their minds. Pity. Mr. Gonzalez called from Mexico to say he might be in London from the 21st uh, to the 25th. He said he wanted to see you then. Oh, good. I hope he can make it. And then a lady phoned, Samantha Ellis. She asked you to phone her as soon as possible. She said it was urgent. Ah, Samantha. I wonder what she wants. Oh, and just before five, Mr. Berry phoned. He told us not to supply Mason & Co. until further notice. He said it was important and that he would explain later. Anything else? No. That's it. Coffee? Please. That would be nice. A few questions. Who's there? The police. Open up. Uh, hold on a minute. I'm in the bathroom. Come on, open up. Oh, Sergeant Grimes. What can I do for you? Is this a social call? Very funny, Harry. I've got a few questions to ask you. Can I come in for a minute? Have you got a search warrant? No. Why? Do I need one? Have you got anything to hide then, Harry? No, no, nothing at all. Come in. Questions, you said. Well, fire away. Just a routine check, Harry, that's all. Just a routine check. Were you in a Mile End Road last night? No. Um, have you been there recently? No, no, I haven't. Why? Has there been any trouble? I think I'll ask the questions, Harry. Where were you last night? I was in the pub. The pig and whistle. Did anybody see you? Oh, yes. I've got plenty of witnesses. Witnesses, Harry? You haven't been accused of anything? Yet? Why do you need witnesses? I don't, Sergeant. I don't. Uh, I was with uh, some of my mates. I didn't know you had any, Harry. Who were they? Uh, let me think. Tommy Ferret, Albert Bloggs and... Uh... What? Albert the Boot Blogs? I thought he was still inside. No, they let him out last week. He got two years remission for good behaviour. Oh, yes. Sid Parker was there, too. What time did you get there? And what time did you leave? I suppose I got there about seven and left at closing time. Did you come straight home? Yeah. How did you get here? Did you drive? Oh, no. I'd had a few drinks. I'd never drive under the influence of alcohol, Mr Grimes. You know me. Think before you drink, before you drive. That's what I always say. Very good, Harry. Very good. By the way, is that your car outside, the Red Granada? That's right. I've got all the papers. I can prove it's mine. Nice car. Especially as you're out of work. Oh, yeah. Well, my grandmother died. Left me some money. I see. Don't mind my asking, do you? Not at all. I mean, it's your job, isn't it? Well, how did you get that dent in the front wing, then? Oh, it happened in a car park. I wasn't there. Someone must have run into it. Fair enough, Harry. Well, I'll be seeing you. That's all for now. Tommy, yeah. Tommy, listen. It's me, Harry. The police have just been round. It was Grimes again. I don't think he knows anything, but he asked a lot of questions. Uh. I told him I was with you. Bloody hell, Harry. Did you have to mention me? I'm sorry, Tommy. Really, I am. Look, we'd better check the details in case they come to see you. What do you mean, in case they come to see me? If I know Grimes, you'll be here any minute. Come on, Harry, tell me exactly what he asked you and what you told him. Trust the heart. Melinda stood at the end of the garden. 
watching the sun begin to set behind the orchard into the sea beyond. She stood as she had done so many times, thinking of that last quarrel two weeks before. She remembered how Damien had at first denied the affair with Tamsin, but then when she had forced him to admit it, how he had apologized and begged her for forgiveness. She sobbed a little as she thought of her harsh words, and how Damien, the only man she had ever really loved, had broken down and cried like a baby when she had refused to see him again. That was two weeks ago, when she had heard nothing from him since. She had tried to telephone. She wanted to admit that she had been unjust, to tell him how much she regretted calling him a liar. She wanted to explain that she hadn't meant to hurt him. Suddenly the noise of the garden gate opening startled her. She turned and through the gloom she thought she could make out the familiar figure of Damien. Was it him? Could it possibly be? The approaching figure stepped into the last patch of sunlight and the last rays of the setting sun illuminated his long, dark, curly hair. He stopped, unsure of himself. Oh, Damien, she called softly. Damien, is it really you? Melinda, he murmured. My Melinda. She sighed deeply and ran to greet him. She took his hands tightly in hers. My darling, she whispered, can you ever forgive me? We must never speak of it again, he replied. But Damien, I never meant... He interrupted her. It's all right. I know that now. My darling, promise me something. Anything, she cried. Here, this is for you. Please, please accept it and wear it forever. He drew a small leather box from his pocket and leaned forward to give it to her. Suddenly the box fell from his grasp. He bent to pick it up and at that moment his glasses slipped from his nose. Blast. Now where have they gone? I can't see a thing without them, he explained. Melinda went to help him. There was a crunch as his foot crushed the glasses into the gravel path. Oh no. Now I've trodden on them, he exclaimed. Why can't I do anything right? Why do I always ruin everything? Her laughter pealed round the garden. Oh, Damien, you silly boy. That's why I love you so much. Weddings Adrian and Caroline were married recently. Our wedding was a pretty typical one, really. Caroline and I met about three years ago, and we got engaged last summer. We both wanted a traditional wedding. I suppose it's expensive, and some people say it's a waste of money, but it is a day to remember all your life. Anyway, we wanted to please our parents, and we both wanted to get married in church. Caroline's father hired a white Rolls Royce to bring her to the church. We wanted the whole works, you know, top hat, tails, champagne, the full treatment. <laughs> the men rented their morning suits for the day. Caroline had three bridesmaids, her sister and two of her cousins, and a page. The page was her nephew. He was only three, and he made a lot of noise during the ceremony. I didn't feel my best that day because my stag party went on until five o'clock in the morning. I do remember the f f f photographs, though. We seemed to be waiting around for ages. Although it was a very sunny Saturday, it was in May, there was a pretty cold wind. The reception was at the Carlton Hotel. It must have cost Caroline's dad a packet. The speeches went on a bit too long, I think. And of course, some of them were a bit vulgar, but I suppose that's a tradition. It took 20 minutes just to read out all the telegrams. I'd been very careful, and I'd parked my car around the corner. But, of course, they somehow managed to find out where it was. You should have seen what they'd done to it. It was covered with lipstick, and they'd tied cans to the bumper. But, anyway, they didn't find out where we were having a honeymoon. We went to Scotland. Stuart and Anne were married in a registry office. Stuart and I met last year. We were both working in Birmingham. Although Stuart comes from Leeds and I'm from London, we didn't want an elaborate wedding and neither of us are particularly religious, so we got married in the registry office. 
Another thing is that neither of our families are very well off, and it seems silly to go to all the expense when you need the money to set up a new home. We just invited our parents and a couple of friends who were witnesses. It was all very simple. We didn't have a reception or anything. We just had a few drinks round at our place. We didn't even bother with a cake. We didn't have a honeymoon because Stuart's just started his own business and we couldn't afford the time. Departures. Gina has been studying English at a language school in England. Her course finishes at the end of this week, and she's returning home on Saturday. She's in a travel agency now. Take a seat, please. I'll be with you in a minute. Yes, what can I do for you? I want to fly to Rome. Are there any seats available on Saturday? Just a moment, and I'll check. Rome. Uh, what time of day are you thinking of going? Well, I'd rather not arrive too late. Uh, how about late morning or early afternoon? Mm. The twelve ten's fully booked, I'm afraid. There are seats available on the fourteen fifty-five or the sixteen thirty. Is that too late for you? Well, the fourteen fifty-five sounds okay. What time does that get in? Eighteen fifteen local time. There's a one-hour time difference, you know. Okay, that'll be fine. I'll pay cash, but I'll have to go to the bank and come back. That's all right. I'll hold the reservation for you. Streamlined taxis. I'd like to book a taxi for Saturday morning, please. Where are you going? A London Airport, Heathrow. There'll be three of us sharing. How much will it be? Thirty-five pounds. Thirty-five pounds each. Or between us? Oh, that's all together. Uh, what time do you want to leave? The check-in time is five to two, but I I don't know how long it takes to get there. Well, we'd better pick you up about half eleven in case we hit traffic. Can I have your name and address? Yes, it's Gina Castelli, two L's, thirty-two Seaport Road. Thirty-two Seaport Road. Okay. 11.30 Saturday morning. Thank you. Come in. Oh, hello, Mr. Jenkins. Hello, Gina. What can I do for you? I've just come to say goodbye. Oh, yes, of course. You're leaving, aren't you? When? I'm flying tomorrow morning. I'm back at work on Monday morning. Well, I must say, Gina, we'll be sorry to lose you. I don't really want to go, but... Well, I just wanted to thank you and all the other teachers. Oh, that's all right, Gina. I've really learnt a lot. I hope to come back next year for a holiday. Don't forget to send us a card, and if you do come back, call in and see us. No, I won't forget. Well, there's the bell. Goodbye then, and have a safe journey. Goodbye, and thanks for everything. Jacques, I'm glad I haven't missed you. Hello, Gina. When are you leaving? Tomorrow morning. I don't suppose I'll see you again. So, goodbye. It was nice meeting you. And you. <laughs> but you will keep in touch, won't you? Yes, I will. You've got my address, haven't you? Yes, and remember, if you're ever in Cherbourg, give me a call. <laughs> I'd be so pleased to see you again. Oh, I will. You can be sure of that. And you must do the same if you're ever in Rome. <laughs> well, goodbye then. Goodbye. And look after yourself. Gina, the taxi's outside. Are you ready? Have you got everything? Yes, thank you, Mrs. Sharples. And thank you again. Oh, thank you, Gina, for the flowers. Now, don't forget to phone us when you get home, just to let us know that you've arrived safely. No, I won't forget. I don't know whether I'll be able to phone tonight or not, but in any case, I'll ring you in the morning, whatever happens. Well, goodbye then, dear. You better not keep the taxi waiting. Have a nice trip. Bye-bye. Bye. And look after yourselves. And thank Mr. Sharples for me. <laughs>